What's going on, fellow A Plusers? It's your host, Adam Perez. We're back once again with a brand new episode of A Plus Hero Report, your weekly stop for your Marvel, DC television, and movie news. Streaming for you guys live today over on YouTube, Facebook, as well as Twitter. Uh, we got ourselves six amazing topics we're going to be getting into as Alien Romulus wind up dropping its first official trailer. We're going to go ahead and certainly dive into that a little bit. We got even Jake Gyllenhaal himself in the news as a possible candidate for Batman. He seems pretty open to it. Uh, we're also going to be jo driving. We're also going to be jumping into some Joker 2 news update for you guys and even a brand new Popeye live action plus a ton more guys. So we'll see you on the other side. <laughs> What's going on, A-plusers? Good to see everybody here today on another Sunday evening edition of A-plus Hero Report. Going a little bit late today. Um, you know, I, I personally like having these um, episodes kind of early in the afternoon for you guys, like around noon or 1 o'clock sort of thing. Um, but that's the life of having a toddler, man. Sometimes you can't find anybody to certainly watch them um, on, the, on a weekend. And so uh, I definitely have to wait for uh, the girlfriend to certainly get home before I can go ahead and tackle a live episode for you guys. So um, that's when you get these seven. 30 evening episodes but you know what i actually don't mind these sometimes um because it gives the opportunity for the day to go by a little bit get some more news uh to certainly drop throughout the day uh give me a little bit more time to kind of organize what topics that we we're going to go ahead and talk about today uh so i'm definitely looking forward to um another episode of a plus hero report but um let me know how you guys are doing this weekend hopefully wherever you guys are at the weather's beautiful it's actually been pretty nice out here in the uh, dfw area of texas to certainly say the least um uh, we had some fun. We had some great content that we dropped um, earlier this week for you guys. We had Boom Boom Girl Episode 3. We had The uh, the Walking Dead, The Ones Who Lived. We dropped that. Uh, Indy came through and dropped his X-Men 97 reviews, Episode 1 through 2. And because of the fact that we had so many damn trailers this week, uh, we went ahead and did a top five um, best trailers of the week for you guys. Um, I kind of really enjoyed doing that. Um, you know, we're always trying to add new wrinkles here to the YouTube channel. If there's things that you guys think that we should probably add um, to the channel, certainly go ahead and let us know in the comment section box below. But, you know, we do tend to update our Facebook page throughout the week with brand new news posters trailers that wind up dropping uh and if we get about five or more throughout the week um expect either friday or saturday for us to drop maybe a top five best movie trailers of the week um because i love movies and i love television and not just movie trailers but television series also uh, so it's really a combination of the top five best trailers that we've seen throughout the week um some we might miss um ones that we definitely get the opportunity to watch we'll definitely talk with you guys about it but if you want to check out our top five movie trailers for the week uh it is currently up on our youtube page so definitely go ahead and certainly check that out but yeah if there's anything new that you guys want to see any new wrinkles additions to the channel uh we're certainly always open for uh options for sure um oh that's right turbo that's right Stuart. i completely forgot man let me go ahead and uh get you that uh that link bro uh hold on one second should i um text it to you or do you need me to uh send it to you in the uh, facebook chat i'm gonna send it to you in the facebook chat here real quick hold on one minute, moment moment bro i was like where's Stuart at i guess Stuart couldn't join me today and i totally forgot that you had asked me to um shoot you that that link since you're not technically at home so i'm gonna send this to you this way through the facebook messenger um and then if you need me to send it to you via our um uh, text message. I'll go ahead and do that for you. I think you got it. I think I saw you pull it up, so you should be good. Um, so yeah, Stuart's going to join us today, guys. So it's not just a one-man army. Um, hopefully, Indy might be able to join us. I don't know. He did say he was going to try, and uh, he's got to work at 10 o'clock tonight, so I'm not quite sure if um, Indy will be able to join us or not. But while we wait for Stuart to certainly join us, uh, let me go ahead and give some shout-outs to the people that are joining us here live. And again, we are um, going live over on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and Twitter again today. Uh, I really like the turnout that we had for Twitter last week. We had like 30 viewers uh, watching us on Twitter. 
Twitter. Um, so do us a big favor, man. Wherever you're watching, hit that like button. Feel free to share, retweet, whatever the case may be. Let everybody know A Plus Hero Report is live tonight. Uh, we got six main topics. We got some honorable mentions that we're going to do as kicking off the show as well. And then towards the end of the show, we're going to be getting your guys' live viewer questions. So a lot to definitely get into. We got Ram Jam in the house. How's your weekend going so far? Pretty good, man. Yesterday was uh, was pretty exhausting. I'm not going to lie. Not going to lie. It was um, my girlfriend's mom's well, birthday today, but we celebrated it last night. We took her out to dinner, um, took her out to a really nice walk at the park also, took kiddo. Kiddo actually wind up going to two parks yesterday, so he, he was just as exhausted as I was by the end of the day. Um, but uh, overall, it's been a really great weekend, honestly. I can't really complain. Uh, Johnny Marrero. What's up, Johnny? Good to certainly see you uh, in here as well. Um, Johnny says, hey, have you seen Kwai on the said documentary, the allegations on Dan Schneider now that Nickelodeon is on full limbo on the live action content? So I personally have not seen it, but the girlfriend watched it last night. Um, she watched some of it. And while I didn't get the opportunity to see um, all of the show, what she what I did watch with her was disturbing as F, man. Disturbing as F. Um, you know, I don't know if I missed all of the... I might have missed the majority of Dan Schneider's run at Nickelodeon. I think I'm. by the time I was older, I think that might have been when he started tackling some of the um, live-action content. I don't know exactly how long he'd been around for, but there were a couple of shows on there that I was kind of familiar with. But I don't know if I watched them regularly, regularly enough to kind of catch all the sexual innuendos and jokes and stuff that were in these shows but man when you when you get to see like just on full blast um people talking you know people that worked with him behind the scenes uh and then they show clips of some of the shows in those moments you're like oh my god like how how do they allow some of this stuff on television bro like it was just it was just full-blown innuendo that just was like Yikes, uh, especially when you're dealing with um, young teenage girls and, and boys and whatnot. Um, yeah, it's pretty disturbing stuff. So well, I haven't watched it fully. Just some of the stuff I was like, dude, this is this is pretty disgusting. It's pretty disgusting. Um, we got Stuart in the house. We got Stuart in the house. Let me go ahead and bring you in, buddy. Hey, hey. Uh, yes, I actually did see that uh, documentary. And yeah, completely very disturbing. Uh, it did yeah. clarify one thing for me that was kind of a misconception going into it. I was under the assumption that Dan Snyder himself was was like personally like one of the predators that were like on set. And while you know, obviously he's not an innocent person because, you know, if we watch the, the documentary, he is definitely a misogynistic, sexist asshole. Uh, it wasn't as bad on his end as I thought it was, you know, going into the documentary, uh, you know, compared to the other, like, you know, the three people that they uh, they call out, like, as actual, like, uh, predators on set. Like, it was a very hard uh, documentary to watch, though, because yeah. especially because, um, you know, Drake and Josh, all that, I used to love those shows as a kid. So, yeah, uh, I think so that's just, where I started. The, the All that, I think, for me is where it connected with. After that, there were a couple of shows here and there that I – knew of but didn't watch fully but yeah the, the all that all that aspect was one that i was fully enveloped in yeah and my knowledge for most of the ones that came after that like i did watch the first season of iCarly, but that was kind of when i was growing out of uh, that era of nickelodeon but uh when it came to everything else like victorious and sam cat uh my knowledge of that all comes from quentin reviews because <laughs> he suddenly like made a complete 180 on his channel one day and then just like completely turned it channel where he just like reviews all those shows and it was great because i've always had curiosity about those shows but not enough to watch it so it's right. like those videos filled my curiosity without me have to like actually watch those shows <laughs> but uh I'm, I'm glad you wanted to bring that up johnny yeah because um well again well i haven't fully watched it just what i watched alone was disturbing and hard to watch i looked at my girlfriend i'm like god damn this is crazy stuff and i yeah it was it's was pretty tough to watch um johnny also says he got issue two of the mmpr the return and it's so good i've been hearing a lot of people talking really highly about it man um i haven't collected a boom studio comics and power rangers for quite some time but maybe it's worth um checking out and seeing if i can kind of catch up to it um let's see here blossom to answer your question about how we were burnt out but totally okay now that i'm on spring break yeah enjoy that spring break especially as a teacher uh definitely enjoy your spring break 
Um, Enrique, just saw the official trailers for the upcoming Harold and the Purple Crayon movie um, starring Zachary Levi based on the children's book and animated series. Uh, yeah, the trailer looks pretty good. Um, he also saw Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And it was amazing. Also saw Pixar's Luca in theaters for the first time um, uh, in the weekend. Very cool. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm, that's I, cool. They re-released it. Yeah, I would assume so with the Luca. Um, um, hopefully, I'll get the opportunity to see Frozen Empire this week. You know, Stuart, I actually finally watched um, Afterlife this past week. Oh, how was it? Uh, I, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, I had a blast with um, Ghostbusters Afterlife. The only aspect of oh, Afterlife Ghostbusters I, Afterlife. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Ghost, yeah, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Um, I really enjoyed it, man. I had it. I thought the cast was great. I really enjoyed the 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 Spangler storyline and stuff. Um, you know, I will say this: the only drawback I thought for Afterlife for me was that it had a little bit of the Force Awakens effect in the sense of like kind of rehashing story beats of the original um you know with 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 kind of a new or you know a new twist to it if you will um i still wish it was more of a original i mean it is an original story don't get me wrong but the idea of them going back and revisiting you know i mean the key master the gatekeeper i mean we it just you know just hitting the same beats again that was really the only fault that i had with the movie but other than that man i had a really fun time with it yeah what did you think of afterlife yeah, I really enjoyed Afterlife. I think, uh, you know, it was, it was really interesting looking at that one, how they really wanted to kind of like with Force Awakens, they wanted to play it safe. They wanted to earn the fans trust, like show, hey, we can uh, do Ghostbusters right. Um, and then after that, you look at the trailer for Frozen Empire. I haven't seen it yet, but it is on my list. And I just love how it's like we played it safe. We gave it a modest budget. Now we're going balls to the wall. You know, now it's back in New York City. Suddenly the special effects are all over the place. Uh, haven't seen it yet, but it looks pretty fun. Yeah, it looks pretty fun, too. Um, I haven't really read too many reviews, so we'll see how it goes. Um, got Noah in the house. What's up, Noah? Certainly good to see you in here. I was like, is that my son? But no. No. <laughs> wait is that is that me and, i don't know who that is but hey it's another noah uh who else we got in here um oh <laughs> what's up cindy um my girlfriend in the house that must have been maybe that was noah i have no idea um but cindy says daddy working uh yeah he tries to i have to literally lock my door now because he makes these like unannounced cameos from time to time in my videos <laughs> he just opens the door walks in now um so yeah it's like uh, the movie American Reunion when, uh, like, the very beginning, of, like, opening scene. What? You can open doors now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. He catches me off guard so many times. Um, I mean, he's he's definitely done that on the show here once or twice, just randomly opening the door and coming in. I'm like, what the? <laughs> Where'd you come from? But, yeah, I, I got to literally lock my door now. Um, um, I am so sorry. I know I just got here. Yeah, go but for I it, will man. be right back. Yeah, go for it, All man. Right. I'm going to jump into honorable mentions real quick while you're gone. So um, let's go ahead and get into our first uh our first segment of the day. Uh, we're going to get to uh, honorable mentions for you guys. Um, honorable mentions, if this is your first time here at the channel, topics that we're going to go ahead and talk about that didn't quite make the cut for our six topics, um, but topics that we certainly felt that you deserved to know about still. Um, first and foremost, James Gunn is doing his teasing thing once again uh, as he wind up um, teasing us about an upcoming possible dead man movie um james gunn went ahead and you know he doesn't say anything literally, literally homeboy just drops these images uh this is the image that he wind up dropping here this week um look it's already kind of confirmed that we're gonna have ourselves a swamp thing film um in chapter one gods and monsters for his upcoming dcu you know james gunn likes to do this in the sense of just dropping an image and not really saying much of anything he did that with uh um i believe it was mr terrific one time he also dropped a terrifics image where it was metamorpho mr terrific plastic man and somebody else as, as well Maybe kind of teasing the option, like, are we going to get ourselves a Terrifics movie down the line? Who knows? But he dropped this also. So I am kind of curious uh, with the idea of this being Dead Man. Uh, we know we have a Swamp Thing movie coming out. I do wonder if this is a tease at either a solo Dead Man movie or if we are building up towards maybe a Justice League Dark sort of film. Um, I certainly would love that option. Uh, I don't know if the 
Justice League Dark that J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot, um, when it was originally announced a couple of years ago, I don't know if that is completely canceled or not, or if um, James Gunn and maybe James, you know, um, J.J. Abrams have decided to talk together and continue to push forward with whatever movie he's wind up creating. But, you know, look, we haven't heard any notion of James Gunn tackling a Justice League movie. We do know that we're going to be getting ourselves a Teen Titans film. You know, it would not surprise me if he still continues to avoid Justice League in their original form by maybe going somewhere along with um, Justice League Dark. I definitely do think that they uh, deserve to be on the big screen. I love Constantine. I'm still waiting for my damn Zatanna movie uh, that I definitely think deserves to be made. Um, so maybe Dead Man is another link to the piece of that kind of coming together. Maybe you do a Dead Man solo, maybe a Swamp Man so Swamp Thing solo, and maybe eventually we get ourselves to Justice League Dark. Who definitely knows? But um, James Gunn is cooking, man. James Gunn is cooking. He definitely loves uh, giving his teases for sure. Um, but I kind of want to know what you guys think. Would you like a Dead Man movie? Uh, or if anything, would you like to see a Justice League Dark? Definitely go ahead and let me know your thoughts in the comment section box below. Secondly, for honorable mentions, Beetlejuice Baby is back. They actually dropped the brand new teaser trailer this week. Also, as Michael Keaton and Tim Burton return for um, Beetlejuice. And look, we got some exclusive first look images from Entertainment Weekly here this week. Uh, we also posted an Entertainment Weekly article on our Facebook page if you want to check it out. Tim Burton really teases the notion a little bit of um, Michael Keaton just jumping back into his, into his performance rather seamlessly. So uh, I'm, I'm really eager to see Keaton's performance. I think he's an amazing actor. And for him to be able to tackle this role after so many years, again, him and him and Burton have mentioned the idea that, look, if we were ever going to come back for a Beetlejuice 2, the story has got to be there. We have to have a reason for coming back. Um, They definitely don't seem like the duo that's just going to come back for a paycheck. Um, And Keaton has been bo boasting, if you will, about Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice for quite some time. So I'm really looking forward to it. I thought the tease itself was pretty great. Here we get to see Winona Ryder back along with uh, Jenna Ortega, who I believe is her daughter in this movie. Also, uh, another exclusive image here for you guys. Um, you know, we posted the trailer up on our reels on our Facebook page, and we've already broken like 1K views on it. And it's only been up maybe like two, three days. It's probably easily the biggest reel that we have on our Facebook page. Um, but uh, yeah, it's garnering a lot of re reactions. People are certainly talking about it and getting hyped for it. But uh, I like the teaser. I thought the teaser was pretty good. Um, if you want to go ahead and check out the uh, article, it is currently up on our Facebook page. Uh, definitely go ahead and give it a read, y'all. Um, so I'm kind of curious to know what you guys thought about the um, uh, the uh, the teaser itself. Stop the presses. Stop the presses. We got Blossom in the house. What's up, Blossom? Coming through with the super chat. Thank you so much with the $5. Holy macaroni manoli. What the heck is that? Uh, are you talking about Beetlejuice? I'm kind of curious if you're talking about Beetlejuice or not, uh, or maybe you're talking about Dead Man. Um, but yeah, that's Dead Man. He used to be Stuart. If I'm not mistaken, um, if I'm not mistaken, isn't wasn't Dead Man like a a circus performer, like a trapeze artist or something like that that died? Do you recall? No, I think that was a Miracle Man who was the the okay, trapeze artist. Right. Um, was he? I this guy was a, what he was a detective, was. wasn't? Maybe he was a detective. Might have I been. can't remember. I can't remember off the top of my head. If you guys know, certainly let me know in the comment section box below. Um, Stuart, did you get a chance to see the uh, Beetlejuice trailer by any chance this week? I did, you know, much more of a teaser. But yeah, like yeah. Uh, I really like the original Beetlejuice. And I even saw the uh, Broadway show. So you can bet your ass I'm oh. definitely seeing this. Nice. Or, sorry, nice. How Broadway was the wrong one. Uh, it, was, oh. uh, it was a play of Beetlejuice based on the Broadway one. <laughs> oh, what the heck is my... Uh, I think you might be muted. Yeah, that would be me. Huh. Oh, okay, um, cool. I wasn't sure if you were my, my microphone um, or my headphone. <laughs> Next up, honorable mentions, Wizards of Waverly Place uh, is in the news this week. Um, again, I, while this isn't a show that I watch on a re religious basis or anything, whenever Wizards of Waverly Place was on, it usually stayed on. Um, I always had a fun time watching this show for sure. Um, but it looks like, according to Hollywood Reporter, 
they are getting a sequel series. It is, in fact, official. Now, I think a couple months ago, they had actually picked up the green light for like a pilot order to kind of get the opportunity to, you know, have them film something, see if um, Disney would be on board. Uh, and they definitely are. They have officially ordered a series uh, of the upcoming prequel series. Uh, and we are going to be getting a returning David Henry and Selena Gomez, believe it or not. Um, so it's a go. I don't believe that they have an actual um, release date for Wizards of Waverly Place. But I think this is a, I think this is a good pickup, man. I think it's um, uh, I, look, I'm, I have no problem with um reboots or redoing shows especially of popular ones um but uh i think this they, they might there might be something here for it now at the same time Stuart, i say that in the sense that i feel like disney is um is the type that after one season has no problem in cutting bait with a show if it doesn't do the numbers that it certainly wants to so whether or not this is going to be like a one-off season who knows but um are you down for a wizards of waverly place return yeah, I don't see why not. I never watched the uh, original series, but uh, yeah, I'm. I always love it when uh, shows come back and they try to give it like kind of a new angle, especially like because uh, it works with uh, shows like um, Boy Meets Girl or sorry, Girl Meets World. My bad. Um, and then you know other shows like that. Um, uh, Nathan says, "Wow, Selena Gomez is returning. Yep, she's coming back for sure." Actually, that is a good point. Like those two actors uh, that played the kids, they weren't really famous when the show aired, but now they're like really huge. So it is pretty awesome that they were able to get them both back. Yeah, I think so too. Um, let's see here. Um, Marcelino corrects us. He says Dead Man was a circus performer. I thought he was with that weird with that weird pop collar. It was uh, focused on in both Batman: Brave and the Bold cartoon and Justice League animated Dark. Um, Wizards of Waverly. Wizards of Waverly Place will be in production until the first look will reveal at D, uh, D23 Expo 2024 in August. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I wouldn't mind getting an opportunity to check out a, um, a first look. And then last but not least for our honorable mentions, y'all, um, the Acolyte this week uh, wind up making some, uh, some news. We wind up getting ourselves a great teaser poster here, along with a uh, official trailer. I believe they re refer to it as. It definitely felt more like a, a teaser trailer to me. Um, did you get to check this one out too, Stuart? I did. Uh, looks, I, I'm I'm excited for it. Uh, we get multiple Jedi's, and it looks like not myth, not necessarily multiple Sith, but you know, multiple dark Jedi's. Which is something that, you know, as a kid, I've wanted to see for a long time. Multiple lightsaber sp uh, fights on the big screen all at once. <laughs> yeah, when they, you know, when they activated the lightsabers at that tail end of the trailer, um, I definitely got uh, Attack of the Clone vibes. Yes. You know, when they were in the arena and stuff charging, I was like, oh. Um, so, yeah, definitely blew me away getting that, getting an opportunity to see that last sequence. I also love the idea, too, that we're getting some hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, it's not something that I think we get the opportunity to see very often when it comes to Jedi. We are so used to lightsaber battles. But the showrunner, Leslie Headland kind of mentioned the idea. is like, you know, the Jedi right now during this time, this time uh, period, very much at the height of their power, very much as peacekeepers. So the idea of them even having to whip out their lightsaber during this time period is very slim to none, you know, because there's really not that kind of threat around. And so, you know, the notion of them maybe having to handle things sort of hand to hand combat style, I think is pretty cool because it looks like we're going to get some incredible sort of um, some uh, some action sequences in here that I, to I totally get Matrix vibes from it just with the wire work that we're getting an opportunity to see as well. Um, but uh, what did you think about the fighting sequences? Yeah, from the brief uh, bits that we got, it looks pretty awesome. Uh, and yeah, I fully agree. Like, um, you know, it. it when when Disney first acquired Star Wars, it kind of felt like for a while they were too afraid to kind of like leave any or do anything that hasn't already been established in the previous films, do anything too new and uh, and things like that. They want to make sure that they really earn the uh, Star Wars fans. But now I think uh, now that they've had it for a while, now that we've gotten so many different projects, they're like less afraid of trying new things like this. So kind of like how you had a very different look at the Star Wars universe through the show and or I think you could definitely get a different a whole new look in the way like uh um you know force combat can be done in a show like this yeah i totally agree uh, i do like the idea of them kind of taking swings i think the idea too of a murder mystery is an interesting choice for them to kind of go down um i will say this if there is anything that i am a little bit bummed about 
And this is something that um, uh, Leslie Hadlin talked about in some of her recent interviews. She did give us an insight as to how many episodes we're going to have. So we're going to have eight episodes. As far as the length of episodes, though, she says about 30 to 35 minutes. Mm-hmm. So it feels very Mandalorian kind of style. I think she said it was going to be maybe in that in that sort of vein of kind of storytelling. Um, and, you know, th- I guess there was a part of me that was hoping, look, we established something like um, uh, Andor where we had, you know, mature themes, longer episodes, you know, a lot of depth for us to really sink our teeth into. Uh, so I am a little bit bummed in the sense of like eight episodes, 30 minutes. I think she said the longest episode might be like 40 minutes for the finale. So if if there is a worry of mine, the worry I have is how how much depth are we truly going to get into with each episode? Um, and is it just going to be having a sort of begging for more and feel kind of unsatisfied? You know what I mean? Yeah, especially um, like I think that format – kind of worked you know with the mandalorian especially because right. mandalorian was mostly an epic episodic show with like a, a serialized like you know side uh, thing going on but like this seems like it's a show that's going to be completely serialized so to have each episode just be 20 minutes the biggest issue that or i, I can't say issue because obviously the show hasn't come out so maybe it won't be an issue maybe they've magically found a way that this won't be a problem but it seems that you limit yourself uh with breathing space and you're kind of forced to just focus on the plot and you know i just don't think that's as interesting as you know having a little bit of plot having a little bit of character growth but maybe i'm wrong maybe they they found a perfect way to mesh the two in under 30 minutes but it just doesn't seem as likely you know yeah, I mean, I hope so. Um, you know, they have been working on this series for quite some time. I know this has been a project that Leslie Hedlund has um, had up her sleeve for quite some time that she's been wanting to bring to the small screen. So hopefully it works out. I mean, other than that, that's really my only concern I have right now. Visually, I think it looks stunning. Uh, effects look great. I love the set designs. The worlds certainly feel lived in. Great alien designs, too. I mean, we're getting a Wookiee Jedi in here, so I really can't complain in that regards. Some really great actors with... Um, uh, Carrie Ann Moss in here, along with the guy from Squid Game is in here also. So I do think that we'll have some great performances, but I would agree. I, my only worry is how how are they going to allow these episodes to truly breathe and allow us to not only focus on characters, but also plot. But um, maybe they'll surprise us. Maybe they'll surprise us. But June 4th, the Acolyte will be here. Uh, and if you guys are also interested, May 3rd is, in fact, the return of the Phantom Menace to movie theaters. Uh, I think that weekend, uh, that May 3rd, and they're supposed to be giving a sneak peek of the Acolyte ahead of the Phantom Menace film. So if you want to go enjoy the 25th anniversary, you'll also get a sneak peek of the Acolyte. I think it's good, um, good marketing and promotion there. And if you do it at the Draft House, I think we're currently doing a 22-hour marathon, marathon with all right? of the entire uh, Skywalker saga. Yeah, I have seen posters of of that, like the nine episode uh, Star Wars marathon for the Skywalker saga. So um, if you're bold enough, guys, if you're bold enough, uh, go get you some tickets, man, for sure. Um, I did it for uh, Force Awakens while I enjoyed it. I told myself I was never going to do that again. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so you watched all six episodes and then there for the seventh? Yeah, it was uh, it was fun. I uh, had a lot of fr- uh, had like a big group of friends that were with me. We were in like a real cramped uh, theater. Uh, the experience with them was what made it fun. If if I was doing it by myself, it would have been absolutely <laughs> awful because I would have been like you know smushed in between strangers because the seats were not big at all. And by the time we all left, all of us like definitely needed a shower. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so imagine. it was fun, but like just afterwards, we all just like were like, oh yeah, let's. Uh, I'm not doing that for a while. <laughs> was there any intermittent? missions at least yeah uh in between the prequels and the sequels and then right before the force awakens there were so a total of three intermissions okay okay not too bad uh yeah i i definitely would need maybe a longer intermission between each movie like but that's um you know i always wanted to do something like that i had my eyes set on the extended editions of lord of the rings that one time it was re-released but um i never had the opportunity to do a marathon but maybe one day maybe one day um, all right, guys, with that out of the way, you ready to get into some main topics with me, oh, Stu? Oh, what you got? I have a, I got one, one uh, honorable mention. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Let me put up the banner again. Go ahead. 
What you got? So, uh, unfortunately, since I haven't been here the last couple of weeks, I didn't get to uh, talk about Akira Toriyama's passing. Uh, made that man rest in peace because, holy crap, this dude had, like, one of the biggest impacts on my childhood. And also a lot of stuff that I watched in general was uh, a lot of it could have been, like, or some of it definitely was inspired by a lot of his, uh, you know, writing, like, Dragon Ball and all that. Uh, but the honorable mention that I want to give is that there is currently an amusement park based on Dragon Ball Z that is currently in development and it is apparently going to be in Saudi Arabia when it is finished, um, you know, but uh, just amazing. Something I never thought would possibly exist out there. We are getting a Dragon Ball themed amusement park. And that is kind of amazing to me. <laughs> that is pretty amazing. I, I think I saw a trailer or a tease of a trailer. I don't think I finished the whole thing, but I did see like a trailer announcement for uh, for the Dragon Ball Park. I didn't know it's going to be in Saudi Arabia, but that's that's pretty badass, man. I mean. Look, look how far we've come, Stuart. You know? mm -hmm. Incredible that uh, that franchise has grown as much as it has after so many years. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, all right. With that honorable mention out of the way, you ready to get into some main topics, man? Always. All right, guys. Uh, let's go ahead and dive into this. And before we start our main topic again, if you want to go ahead and leave some comments, certainly go ahead and feel free to. Uh, we love hearing your thoughts on some of the topics that we certainly discussed. An opportunity for us to converse with you guys as well, hear your certain opinions in regards to some of the topics that we're going to be breaking down. So again, like, share, repost, whatever the case uh, may be. Let everybody know Hero Report is on tonight. Um, but uh, let's get into our first topic. And man, I think Aliens is back, Stuart. You know, we've had to kind of sit through um, several iterations over the past couple of years. It's been a minute since we even had an alien film. Um, but I think some people have felt like that is um, uh, a franchise that has certainly lost its luster. But I do think projects like uh, Prey uh, for Predator have maybe revitalized people in regards to giving us sort of fresh ideas, fresh takes, if you will. Uh, and it seems as though Alien has really jumped on board that train. Um, there are a couple of Alien projects in the works. I believe there's a Alien television series that's being showrun by Noah Hawley, most notably known for his time with uh, Fargo. Um, and now we've got ourselves another Alien movie in Alien Romulus uh, that this week uh, not only dropped a brand new um, teaser poster, but also a teaser trailer, uh, only coming in at about a minute. But I got to tell you, Stu, uh, it was enough to certainly leave an incredible sort of first impression here. Um, I, I got to ask, um, did you get the opportunity to check out the trailer? Uh, and if so, what did you think, Stuart? Uh, I did check out the trailer. I really, really enjoyed it for the most part. Uh, obviously, it doesn't tell us too much about what we're going to see, but it looks like they brought back one thing that uh, both Prometheus and uh, Alien Covenant kind of lacked, um, and that's the claustrophobia. I feel like even though Prometheus and uh, Alien Covenant definitely had horror scenes that took place on the ship uh, and you were meant to feel like you were in that claustrophobic environment that you had in the first Alien. I just don't think either of them uh, executed it as well as the first one. But looking at the teaser for this movie, that is one thing that it feels like they really brought back is that like a terrifying feeling of you're trapped in this really tight and close space with a monster that is virtually unkillable, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the um, the director, Fetty Alvarez, um, definitely brought back that claustrophobic feel, the tension, the horror. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the things that really stuck out to me, too, um, was the idea of the technology that we see, um, that it feels like he's really like hearkening back to the classic alien film by Ridley Scott. You know, when you look at films with like uh, of Prometheus and Covenant, you know, the type of technology that they use, like for me, especially if they're supposed to be prequels, doesn't necessarily match up to the type of like technology and aesthetics and like set designs that you see of the original. So there are times when it feels like it's almost too clean. Um, and he really does feel like he's getting into his bag in this one of bringing back sort of that Ridley Scott, James Cameron 
uh, sort of vibes. Like when I see when I see this shot here, even though it's not Sigourney Weaver, Weaver as Ripley, like I feel Ripley vibes in here, you know. Mm. Uh, and then the great shot of her kind of looking up, and we get to see the xenomorph alien's face and the little thing kind of shoot out. They had some some great um, some great horrific moments in here. Just the like the the bed full of blood. You don't you don't see the body or what happened, but you just hear the horrific sounds of like a death happening, sort of thing in the background. Um, the what looked like a face hugger being pulled out of somebody's mouth, the slow motion like tail coming out something like just just really gross stuff, man. But it, it just harkens back to a classic sort of alien that has really been missing, I think, for this franchise. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and we also wind up getting an article here this week from um, Fetty Alvarez that I think dives a little bit more into just the um, how this film came together uh, and just some further details about this movie. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into it, too. Uh, this is from The Hollywood Reporter. Alien Romulus director Fetty Alvarez unveils first look talks Ridley Scott and James Cameron approved of the prequel. Um Let's see here. Now, this is um, he, it's a pretty good intro, but it also does talk about actual. Um, let's see. here. OK, here we go. So it's an actual interview that he has here. Um, it says congratulations on the first step towards August's release. The Taylor who was <laughs> the teaser trailer was two hours too short, uh, <laughs> but I'm intrigued. Uh, he says, I went to a crazy extent to make sure I showed a minimum amount at this point. Uh, it's just enough to get you interested, but not too much. I personally hate spoilers or anything that makes me feel like it steals from that night when you finally sit down and watch the movie. And this uh, this teaser doesn't steal that of um, that eventual night, which I got to agree with them. And I think even um, one of our viewers, Marcelino, will probably will agree with him also. He tells me all the time that he tries to avoid uh, trailers because they're just so spoiler filled these days. Uh, but yeah, this mm -hmm. definitely definitely avoided that. He does also go on to say, um, so Alien Romulus takes place between Alien and Aliens, but it's reportedly unconnected to those films. Is that correct? And he say, he clarifies, he says, that's not correct, but it does take place between the two movies. The way we crafted it um, is if you haven't seen any of them, I'm jealous because you'll have an incredible experience. You'll have all these worlds of alien coming at you, and you've never experienced any of this. You don't ha you don't know how the creature is born. You don't know any of these things. It's fantastic. You'll have a blast. So he does confirm that this is sort of canon, if you will, taking place between those two movies. Um, so I, I kind of dig that. I'm 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 a fan of the idea of this not being sort of its own standalone um kind of film personally how do you feel about that though yeah i uh i kind of like that too because i feel like there is a gap that you can really fill in in between alien and aliens uh specifically when it comes to the uh i believe it was like a colony uh place that they went to right in aliens it's been a minute since i've seen it um so you know to I'm assuming that if it's bridging that gap, like we might get answers as to how aliens started invading that colony and uh, what that was like with, uh, you know, them. And then maybe even get like a, uh, like a cameo from Newt, you know, and how she survived. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Um, he also says, um, so it's crafted that way, but hopefully it works that way for everybody, but it is connected to all of them. I love all those movies. I didn't want to omit or ignore any of them when it comes to connections at a story level, character level, technology level, and creature level. There's always connections from alien to alien covenant. Um, it says the synopsis involves a group of young space colonizers and scavengers who encounter the most terrifying life form in the universe inside a rundown space station. Did you choose um, did you choose to focus on a younger cast just because that's relatively new dynamic for the franchise? He says, I wish there was some sort of deep thinking strategy about it. It was really more based on aliens. I remember watching an extended cut of aliens and there's a moment where you see a bunch of kids running around and riding a big wheel around the quarters of this colony. And I thought, wow, would it be, what would it be like for those kids to grow up in a colony that still needs another 50 years to terraform? There's no sunlight. There's no real life uh, except just to take the place of a parent and do the same job they did. Uh, in my movies, I've all, I'm always interested in those characters. Maybe it's because I grew up in a small country of Uruguay. I think it connects to a lot of people who grow up in a small town 
and think that all the important things are happening somewhere else. So when I saw those kids, I remember thinking, if I ever tell a story in that world, I would definitely be interested in those kids when they reach their early 20s and what they want to do and where they want to go. And when it comes to having them encounter the creature, the dynamic is completely different. So that might be the reason why we managed to make it. When Ridley Scott read it, he felt that it was completely different than the other movies. It had all the DNA of the originals and a lot of other movies, but it automatically felt different and fresh, mostly because kids that age approach problems in a completely different way than adults do and professional adults do. So it's just completely different viewing experience. I like that. Yeah, me too, man. I, it just it feels very well thought out. Uh, I like the idea that we are getting ourselves something, uh, a brand new, fresh take uh, on this franchise for sure. Um, yeah, and, and if he's uh, and if he's being honest, like during this interview, it's kind of cool to know that this is going to be written by someone who's thought about this like for a long time. Clearly, if they, if they you know thought about this like when watching the original Aliens, or or specifically the extended cut of the original Aliens. Uh, why does this thing keep jumping around on me? Um, here we go. It says, "When uh, were you asked to pitch what became uh, Alien Romulus, or did you ask if you could come in and pitch it?" And he says, "Right after I did Don't Breathe, I had a meeting with Scott Free, Ridley's company, and I think they were going to start doing Alien Covenant. And I mentioned something that I would love to see. I said, I hope this movie has some of this and that and this. And he was like, Oh, that's interesting. What would you do with it?" No one was actually asking me to pitch. Believe me, it was more that they were intrigued about what I wanted to see as a fan. And I was like, I think you guys should do this and approach it this way. Uh, and maybe it's about that. And suddenly I was pitching and I was not really being asked to do it. So that stayed in the air there somehow. And then a couple of years later, Ridley remembered that he knew about it. He was like, Fetty. Uh, had pitched this thing so they call me back and say hey remember that story you mentioned do you want to write it direct it and i was like f yeah and <laughs> here we are Ridley's um, like well my movies didn't do too well so we'll try your idea <laughs> he does say he said it is it's pretty intimidating to step into a ridley scott franchise but apparently you've passed the ridley test uh he really spent an entire hour telling you how much he loved the movie and he said he did. As intimidating as it is, that's the best part of being able to work on something like this. For all of us and whatever it is that we do, the dream is to sit down with the masters of our craft and have a conversation about what we do and learn how to do it better. And the process of making this film definitely gave me that experience with Ridley. At the story level, we first told him what I was planning to do. And then when he read it, I discussed the script with him. And later when he watched the movie, I discussed my cut with him. So I consider each of these moments and creative conversations with Ridley to be a highlight of my career. He says, James Cameron is also someone I've met through the years, and when he learned that I was doing it, we started chatting about it. So I also had that conversation with him at the script level. He's now seen the movie, and he loved it. It's also fascinating because Cameron and Scott's notes and comments are completely different. They wouldn't. They would not repeat a note. Whatever Ridley said, Cameron said something different. They were all super smart comments, notes, and thoughts on the film and filmmaking, etc. But both both of them had completely different approaches. So the fantastic part of being able to make this film was to have a chance to work with them. I, I think that's bananas. I think that's a really cool opportunity. One to be able to get praise from not only Scott but also James Cameron of them loving the film clearly you've done something right and i think for me as a viewer that honestly like gets me hyped in the sense of you know we're we're not rehashing we're not doing something that we've seen before to be able to get those two creators who themselves are certainly legends to approve of what you've done uh, i think is 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 pretty incredible but uh, what do you think about the idea of them having like just two completely different mindsets when tackling the notes and whatnot for for this film uh, that definitely makes a lot of sense because as amazing as uh, Alien and Aliens are, they are two very different type of movies. Uh, so it makes sense that they would have two very separate types of uh, feedback. Although that, that being said, though, I would not be surprised if this movie did bad in theaters. If suddenly James Cameron completely did a 180 and was like, oh, yeah, I knew this movie was going to be terrible. Just like he did with uh, Terminator Genesis, just like he did with uh, Terminator Dark Fate, where both of them, he was like, oh, yeah, I saw these movies. They're great. Fans are going to love them. They bomb at the box <laughs> office. Oh, yeah, no, those movies were an insult to my franchise. That's true. <laughs> 
That's true. He did. He did hype up Dark Fate pretty, pretty hard. Um, definitely made me believe like, oh, man, this is going to be this is going to be pretty good. But I think the idea that one, I haven't seen James Cameron like publicly talk about this movie yet. But the idea that he's able to have the those conversations directly with the director and give him those thoughts. It's just like he's not blowing smoke up his ass. You know what I mean? Like I would think as a director, mm -hmm. you, you, you're going to be completely honest with the person that's actually making this film and not just uh, want to make them feel good sort of moment. Yeah. Um, and then he also last question. Uh, and if, if you guys want to go ahead and read this article, it is on HollywoodReporter.com. Um, and uh, we also posted it on our Facebook page. He says, lastly, you just touched on the Wayland Utani spaceship that your team built. But overall, how did you balance practical effects and VFX? And he says, for the creatures we brought uh, in all the guys from aliens, uh, they were in their early 20s when they made aliens and now they were part of the stan winston special effects team and now we had them at the top of their game uh they made their own shops uh and so we brought them all together to work on all the creatures because we went with all animatronics and puppets at every level uh, i even got the chance to be under the table with them puppeteering all of these animatronics uh, he says, I have this obsession with no green screens, so we built every creature and set. Everything had to be built, so we were really living and breathing in these spaces. But I'm not an anti-CG guy. I got a chance to do Evil Dead because I had um, made this short movie called Panic Attack with a couple of friends, and we did all the CG. So I come from a background where I know how to build the effects myself. I still do VFX shots in my movies to this day. I'll cut and do a VFX shot on my computer sometimes. So it's just whatever is the best for the shot. And when it comes face-to-face -face encounters and moments with creature, nothing beats the real thing. Um, he Damn, says, my height level just like doubled right there. <laughs> right? Right? Um, that's just going the extra mile, man. And, um, you know, I, we talk. I talk about this all the time, like, um, and maybe not so much in the sense of like animatronics and puppeteers and like practical effects, but as much as I love the technology that is like the volume, you know, I see Lucasfilm and other uh, studios really using that LED screen sort of technology for the volume. But there is aspects of like on set locations um, that I think really just heighten a movie. I think it just gives you a wider scope when you watch them. And you can really tell these days, I think, like when somebody's in front of an LED screen or when they're actually on a set sort of thing. So the fact that, one, he clarifies, look, I'm not an anti-CG guy, but there is just something um, – uh, palpable that about um, being able to have an actual creature or like the actual puppet kind of in front of you that I do think is going to heighten the movie going experience for sure. Um, he says for the sets, we built spaceships, we built miniatures. We went back to all of that. And then we figured out ways to marry it with the CG world. There's some things that only CG can do for that scope and movement. So it really has to be the right tool for the shot. Ideally, you should never feel like you're watching CG. Ideally, there should be nothing there where the audience goes, well, that's clearly CG. It should always feel practical. But I prefer practical because I want to see where I'm there on set. There's nothing worse than having nothing to look at when I'm shooting, but some things that are CG can really blow your mind when done right. Uh, and I think so too. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, if anything, Stuart, we're probably going to get some of the best performances out of a uh, alien cast that we have sort of in a while. You know, like when I, when I see shots like this, you know, in a movie trailer, it's the idea that when she looks up, she's actually seeing a creature. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? That's that's designed and being controlled. And if that's not terrifying enough, man, I have I have no idea what is. So I think Fede saying all the right things. I think the idea of him explaining the extra work and lengths that they've gone through to make this movie feel real, uh, along with the idea of the approval that he's gotten from. Um, you know, other legends from Alien and Aliens. Uh, I think he's I think he's in his bag in this one, man. And again, it's only a, a one minute teaser, but it definitely is enough for me to feel like they're cooking like they, they've got something special going on here. Oh, yeah. Um, it's got everything. Uh, everything that's been said in the interview has just gotten me more hyped. The fact that you got the approval from both James Cameron and Ridley Scott and the fact that, you know, he mentions using a lot of practical effects, but also not being anti-CG. So, you know, when we see CG in the movie, it's most likely going to be for, you know, a, a, 
a, a use that like you couldn't possibly do with or that something that you pro couldn't possibly do with like practical effects um because you know i do talk a lot about how i like practical effects more than cg but i also don't think either one should replace the other i think that they both should coexist because i think that's when you end up making a even more solid uh you know overall product you know you know, there's an interesting shot here when this trailer begins of like the spaceship kind of, you know, going through the stars and it's headed towards the um, the the space station. Like there's a part of me that wonders if, if those are miniatures, you know, like I wonder if those are mini like I don't know why I get classic like Star Wars vibes in the sense of seeing George Lucas and them be on set using miniatures for a lot of their movements and their spacecrafts and stuff. But then also adding a touch of CG to kind of make them seamlessly kind of work together. Um, so now that I know that he created a lot of the spaceships and miniatures, I am very curious about these um, outside, you know, these outer space shots where you see some of these vehicles. So I'm pretty curious about that. I do think personally that like uh, spaceships look better uh, as long as it's not like a full on epic space battle. But if it's just a spaceship flying through space, I think they look better with uh, miniatures personally. Obviously, when it comes to space battles, I come, I feel like that's the one area where it's like you can do it with miniatures, but it's just easier to take the shortcut and do CG with that. <laughs> I think there is something just the, like the attention, the detail uh, for miniatures. Um, so I'm really eager to kind of see what these guys uh, put together here. Uh, Marcelino, he says, uh, last year I watched all the Alien solo films for the first time. And I have to admit, they are a perfect blend of horror and sci-fi. And then we have Resurrection. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree with you. I do want to. I I will say after reading this and watching the trailer, I, I do want to go back and watch the the first two at least. Mm -hmm. I did rewatch the uh, first one because I did like kind of a trilogy. I watched Prometheus for the first time because I actually hadn't seen that before. Uh, then I rewatched Alien Covenant and uh, made a little bit more sense now with the Prometheus. I also think they should have called it Prometheus too because it's a direct sequel, which I didn't <laughs> know going into it. Uh, and then you know uh, Alien One, which of course still holds up, of course. Um, I don't think I've I don't believe I've seen Covenant. Um, I did see Prometheus and I enjoyed it, but I I have not seen Covenant yet. So maybe that's one I um. Would you recommend that I check it out since I've seen Prometheus or what? Or should I just leave it alone? If you can watch for free, it's worth a it's worth a watch. Uh, it's not a bad movie, but it's just okay. it's not very memorable. I get you. Okay, so maybe I'll maybe I'll try and check it out for sure. <laughs> Except okay, there there is a uh, there is a scene between Michael Fassbender and Michael Fassbender because he plays two different uh, <laughs> robots, okay. and uh, oh my gosh, just the the phrasing in the scene you'll know exactly what i mean but it's supposed to be like one ai meeting his uh, other ai uh, doppelganger wow. and they have a moment and just the phrasing is so weird between the two of them <laughs> okay i'll be i'll be mindful of that scene when i get to it but uh, yeah i definitely want to go ahead and check it out for sure um, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts. Um, if you've had the opportunity to check out the Alien uh, Romulus teaser trailer, go ahead and let me know your thoughts in regards to it. Um, any of the comments that uh, Fetty Alvarez had to say about this film, is there anything that certainly jumped out to you? Again, if you want to check out the full uh, interview itself, it is on HollywoodReporter.com or over on our Facebook page. So go ahead and certainly check it out. Um, and with that out of the way, let's move on to our next topic, Stuart. Um, and we're going to go ahead and dive into our MCU bag here a little bit um, as we start getting into sort of our uh, comic book movie aspect of things. What you got, Stuart? Oh, just uh, the most recent comment from uh, uh, Marcelino, the very last one you just put. Yeah, it was actually going to be the director who did uh, District 9 that was going to work on that movie. Would have been really cool to see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would have been pretty neat to see, actually, too. I wouldn't have mind seeing that. Um, all right. And uh, from there, you know, we're going to go ahead and stay in the. We're going to go ahead and jump over to Marvel. But we'll kind of keep it in the horror element a little bit, um, as it seems as though uh, Marvel is going to be continuing to take some risk when it comes to its Marvel animation side of things. Uh, for those of you who have not had the opportunity to check out the What If series, 
um, season one, episode five, had the opportunity to focus on Marvel Zombies, a very popular comic book run. I think it was a small limited series um, that Marvel Comics wind up having, but enough to certainly leave an impression uh, where people have been wanting uh, Marvel Zombies for quite some time. And they definitely teased it for us in season one of What If, leaving episode five on a little bit of a cliffhanger in the sense that there is plenty more story to definitely be told. And uh, believe it or not, Stuart, they have not forgotten about it as uh, Marvel Zombies is certainly still on their slate. And one of the executive producers over in animation this week as he was hyping up X-Men 97 um, got uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about Marvel Zombies. And uh, he's saying, look, they're not pulling any punches here, Stuart. Um, they're actually going to be giving us a TV MA rating, uh, which is pretty bananas here. So let's go ahead and dive into this animated marvel zombie series is for sure a tv ma show says the marvel's head of animation uh it says um, um brad winderbaum just confirmed that the company's upcoming project marvel zombies is going to be pretty intense and will likely necessitate a tv ma rating we already knew the show was going to be bloody but it looks like it's going to be even more graphic than we thought uh, it says Windham ba uh, Winderbaum revealed as much in a recent interview with IGN about X-Men 97 when he was asked if Marvel might delve into uh, more of a genre of adult animation. And he says in terms of more mature animation, yeah, we're making Marvel zombie show right now that is pretty intense. Uh, that's for sure a TV MA show. When he was comparing it to X-Men 97, he then added again saying um and again it's trying to honor the comics and what was so great about the comics was it's not pulling its punches that's certainly what we're going to do uh for that on that project also uh so it says comic fans got a sneak peek of what their favorite heroes would look like among the undead in season one episode five of, of what if when the avengers are infected with a quantum virus that starts a full-on zombie apocalypse uh, it does say that the episode ends on a suspenseful note that left many wondering if they would see more of a uh, zombie Thanos um, or any postmortem versions of popular MCU characters for that matter. And the answer is a resounding yes. Um, they did say back in 2022, San Diego Comic-Con, uh, the company revealed the aftermath of what if Cliffhanger is coming in the form of a miniseries called uh, Marvel Zombies. So it seems as though um, this um, series will be taking place right after the um, episode five of um, What If. Um, so, Stuart, with um, Marvel Zombies coming, a possible TV MA show, are you even... Well, first off, were you hyped or interested in Marvel Zombies? And now that you've heard about this, has your interest peaked a little bit more or what? Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been hyped about this since I saw the uh, first image that they revealed and it showed uh, Icarus from the uh, Eternals movie as a zombie. Oh, and yeah. uh, so basically a zombie Superman in this in this world. So that's going to be I'm excited to see how that all is uh, going to play out. Um, but yeah, giving it a TVMA rating, meaning that they're not going to pull any punches. Absolutely love that. Uh, and it gives me an excuse to rewatch that episode because I actually haven't watched it since the uh, episode first aired. Yeah, um, I actually wind up watching it. Um, I actually wind up watching it this morning to um, get familiar with it because it had been it had been a minute, and uh, I really enjoyed the episode for sure. Uh, you know, I do. I, I like the setup for the story, showcasing the idea of like the quantum virus kind of getting loose. You know, they they kind of throw it back to. Um, the what if scenario for Ant Man and the and the Wasp, where um, Hank Pym goes to the quantum quantum realm to go ahead and get um, Janet, but when he comes across Janet, she's already kind of infected, and Janet winds up taking the ship back. Um, and upon reveal of hope, like my mom's back, sort of thing, boom, she's a zombie, and she comes in and she winds up kind of. I think she winds up getting Scott Lang first. And then from there, it just continues to spread. And um, you get to even see the Avengers wind up getting infected, too. Uh, and it's it's pretty incredible. Uh, for me, you know, I was really fascinated in sort of like 
the group of characters that they chose to kind of focus on in this episode and really who's sort of like the last man standing in here. Um, you know, for those of you who have not seen the episode, I would definitely go ahead and recommend you guys certainly check it out for yourself. You know, I don't want to necessarily spoil. I mean, look at this, this, this series has been out for like two years now. If you haven't watched this episode, you know, I, I probably shouldn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be spoiler free, but I'll give you guys the opportunity to certainly check it out. But based off of who is certainly left, uh, I am kind of curious where this series certainly goes. Um, and if anything, you know, the question I would have is who's going to be doing the animation for this? When you saw the Icarus zombie, was it still kind of in the same vein as um, the What If series or was this um, a different art style? Stuart, do you recall? If I remember correctly, it was the same art style, I believe. Okay. Um, I would look, I, I did I do like the what if art style. Um, the way that what if season two ended, I am very I'm definitely expecting a season three for sure. But um I, I am kind of curious if the animation studio can certainly do two series at once. Um, if they're gonna be using that same art style. And I, I will say this though. I would be open to other types of art styles. I think for me, like one of the, I don't the one of the biggest complaints I think I have with things like Star Wars animation is that a lot of their stuff tends to look the same, you know, um, with the exception of maybe like visions where we finally have like different anime studios kind of tackling um, things like that. But for the most part, you know, when you go from, um, Clone Wars to Rebels and then the Bad Batch, you know, it's like the same art style over and over again. And while it worked for maybe a series or two, you know, when you start getting to your third, your fourth series, I'm like, okay, like I, I wouldn't mind another studio getting an opportunity to tackle something. So I will be interested to see how um, Marvel's Zombies certainly looks when we get the final um, the final tease, and maybe that's something that we'll wind up getting later on this year at maybe like a D23 or if they're at San Diego Comic Con, I'll definitely look forward to it. But, um, I did like, I do like the what if, um, art style, so I'm really, I'm very much interested in seeing what this is going to be like. And if anything, though, if you did get the opportunity to check out the, um, the what if episode, it's not really graphic, you know, they definitely weren't trying to touch that TV MA rating, certainly at the time, really cool zombie designs and whatnot, but you don't really see like any blood splattering, any like um, ripping of body limbs sort of thing apart from somebody. Um, they definitely try and keep that type of stuff in the shadows. Um, but it seems like they're going to be pretty open to it this time around, Stuart. Yeah, uh, which which is good. Like, um, as much as I do love them making animated content that's good for all audiences, like they did with What If and like what they're doing currently with uh, X Men ninety seven, I also want to mind a little variety in the sense of yeah, give me something that's purely for adults. And hey, you can even go the Star Wars route where they currently have a show that's meant for a really really young audience. Um, I cannot remember the name of it, but it's the one that takes place uh, in the High Republic era. Uh, oh, but yeah, it's like that. I Adventures. Yeah, yeah, that one. So it's like, you know, uh, if Star Wars can have one for like a really young audience like that, I don't see why Marvel can't. So it's like, yeah, just reach out all the audiences. Give us one for just adults. Give us one for just for kids. And then give us the what if, which is like everyone can enjoy it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they did say that the Marvel team hinted to convention goers at the time that the show will have all the gore splatter you want from a zombie show. Uh, so maybe we'll get ourselves a little Walking Dead style kind of um, violence in this. Uh, but I do think the idea of a TV MA rating works really well. And especially coming off of a series like Echo, um, it just goes to show you that they're certainly not afraid to dive into that world. Uh, I am kind of curious if the TV MA will certainly trans like will work into Daredevil Born Again also. Um, but it seems as though look, Marvel has mentioned in the past we're not pulling any punches. You know, originally they wanted to just keep things PG 13, but now we got ourselves Deadpool that's certainly coming. We just had Echo also. Um, so they're definitely open to the idea of giving us some uh adult sort of um um content for sure in that regards. 
the fact that the only Marvel movie we're getting this year is R rated. That's uh, that's funny to me. That's something that you, if you told me like probably four years ago, I would have been like, eh, I doubt that. <laughs> Yeah, right. I think a lot of people did too. Um, like, um, for, like Nathan says that that rating makes me laugh. We we shall see. I mean, they have done mature things with that with that um, with that rating before. So I don't necessarily think it's like a mystery or like a they'll say one thing but then they'll mean another. I mean, if, I I do think if they're gonna say you're gonna see splatter and gore, I definitely am gonna go ahead and certainly believe them in that regards. Um, you checked out. Yeah, you checked out Echo. How was Echo in that regards? Ah. Uh, I liked it uh, up until the last episode. I felt like the last episode was just really, really, really rushed. Like they just really like thematically, I guess what they were going for made sense, but just writing wise, everything just felt so forced at the very end. But, but I mean, building up to that. Huh? But I mean, like the, the rating wise, if it came, if it was TV and oh, I mean, sorry, rating wise. Sense? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah, yeah definitely. It definitely showed a bit more blood than you normally would see a lot along with like uh, it, it, it's it's like something about the sound effects of like how people get hit in the show. It comes off as a lot more brutal than, you know, it, it, if someone were to get knocked out by Captain America in one of the movies, how it's just like instant knockout. You barely see any blood at all. And also sound effects, you know, make it sound more cartoony, whereas in Echo, you know, they tend to sound like a real punch. The So it, therefore, like the impact feels more brutal. You know what I mean? I get you. I get you. Um, who else we got in here? We got Dottila saying Marvel Zombies. Yeah, Marvel Zombies. <laughs> um, definitely go ahead and check out, uh, again, uh, season one of What If, episode number five. Um, and I do love What If series in the sense of, like, they're just one-off episodes from time to time. Like, you can really just digest one episode and walk away from it, if you will. Um, I love how now it's just become an internet meme that every show needs to have like a what if uh, series now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Blossom with the super chat again. Thank you so much, man, for certainly coming through for us, Blossom. We really appreciate it. She said, I was never keen on zombies. Jeez, oh, Molly, talk about nightmare fuel uh, for sure. For sure. Um, I mean, I'm just watching um, The Walking Dead, uh, the ones who live, and uh, man, they, they're still intense. Even you know, even after having watched this series for such a long time, you know, falling off and then kind of coming back, um, it's just like <laughs> even the slow walking zombie. It just almost feels like inevitable. Like you're just waiting for that bite. And I just think you know, even when it comes to somebody like Rick and Michonne, where you're just thinking to yourself like they're not going to off them in this episode, right? Like there is still a level of intensity and like fear that the idea of like a walker certainly still brings you know what i mean yeah has uh rick lost his hand in the show by any chance um spoiler warning to y'all out there if you are interested yes he has yay finally <laughs> it took a spin-off show for them to finally give him his iconic losing hand <laughs> and you know and you know what you know what's even funnier about that is that uh, apparently Andrew Lincoln has been asking for this to happen for like the longest time. Like Robert Kirkman says that he even regrets the idea of like cutting off Rick's hand because the idea of like just the less mo mobility that he has. And they said when he went into the ones who live, that was like a must for Andrew Lincoln. He's like, you gotta take my hand off. I like, I'm, and he was adamant about it. Like the showrunners were like, no, like we just we do not want to do that. And Andrew was like, we're doing it. And um, <laughs> it don't it don't take him long to do it either, Stuart. I'll just I'll just say that um, it's it's pretty brutal, man. Uh, I would highly recommend you check out the ones who live if you haven't seen it yet. But I think they've I think that they have managed to handle the one hand Rick Grimes extremely well, honestly. So I've I've been really mm -hmm. pleased with it. Yeah, I, actually, I absolutely love the way it was handled in the uh, comic books, mostly because, like, the way it happens, it's just uh, – it comes, like, right when you feel like the group is kind of safe. Like, not at its safest, but pretty safe. And they meet this guy who introduces himself as the governor, and he seems like a pretty pleasant fellow. Then out of nowhere, this guy just shakes Rick's hand, and then boom! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, I do remember that season, too, thinking to myself, like, this is the episode he loses it, bro. Like, they, I think they teased it out the ass, and it just it just never happened. But yeah, anyway, mm. um, but yeah, zombies blossom nightmare fuel for sure. Uh, but yeah, guys, let us uh, let us know your thoughts on the idea of Marvel animation taking the stand on TVMA. Uh, Marvel zombies is not going to be for the week 
of heart for sure. So uh, definitely go ahead and let me know your guys' thoughts in the comment section box below. What One last thing I'll say about it, something I also do love about having an MA uh, rating is that uh, assuming that the show is going to be mostly a show that takes itself seriously, I do love uh, being able to have more adult animation that's like not like a, a generic adult comedy, like adult animation that can actually tell like a serious, engaging story. Not that I have anything against adult, adult comedy animations, uh, the, like a lot of my favorite shows are adult uh, comedy animations, but um, I just you know want more variety in that realm of animation. You know, I, I do think we'll get a couple chuckles though for sure. Um, oh, yeah. I, I definitely expect some from like Spider-Man himself, you know, Peter Parker, Scott Lang, whatever the case may be. I think we're going to have some pretty funny one-liners for sure. Um, but yes, it's Marvel after all. You got, you definitely have to, but, um, again, if they're going to be doing the TVMA thing, then yeah, you're probably right. They probably will have some, um, some pretty, uh, intense storylines for sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, from there. Uh, what we got here? Ram Jam. I'm interested in a Marvel Zombies animated series. Yeah, me too. I'm still excited for Marvel Zombies. Hopefully we get more details as the year progresses uh, with everything that's happening right now with um, the MCU. I think Marvel Zombies is something that you can just drop and not necessarily have to worry about it connecting with uh, anything else sort of thing. So it, it may be being its own standalone probably works for it. But uh, yeah, guys, let me, let me let us know your thoughts in the comment section box below. Uh, and from there, Stuart, let's go ahead and dive into some uh, some uh, DC talk. Um, no zombies, unfortunately, in here. But, um, you know, the next best thing, I guess, um, the darkness, the dark night uh, is back in the news this week. As uh, we just had a movie that wind up dropping featuring Jake Gyllenhaal himself. Um, um, damn, what was the name of the movie? It just slipped my mind. It was just came on. Uh, Roadhouse. Boom. There Roadhouse. we go. Roadhouse. Oh, yeah. The remake, right? Yeah. The remake of Roadhouse just dropped uh, this week. If you guys haven't checked it out, go ahead and do yourselves a favor. You know, I haven't seen the original Roadhouse myself, um, but I might have to go ahead and check it out before I check out this remake personally. But uh, I bring up Jake Gyllenhaal because one of the things that we've been pretty fascinated about, especially after Alan Rickman, uh, Rick, Rick, what's it? Rick Rickson? Rick Richardson? I can't Rickman, remember the guy's yeah. name. Rickman, right? Um, yeah, he, he had put his name in the hat to be the upcoming Batman. Uh, and since then, it looks like now. Wait, Jake, oh, oh, wait, sorry. Uh, you're uh, not, not who I was thinking. Of. I, Alan I thought Rickman. you mentioned. I, yeah. It's the guy from, <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, isn't Alan, Rick, that's the guy that passed away, isn't it? Um, yeah, no, we're talking about the guy from, um, um, Reacher and Titans, right? Reacher and Titans. Yeah. yeah. I think it's Rich Richardson or something like that. Uh, I can never pronounce oh, his totally last forgot. name. Yeah, if you can look it up for me, if you got the opportunity, to. I don't know if you have a, a laptop there or not. But yeah, um, I got my phone. I can. Yeah, if you can look it up real quick. Um, but anyway, Jake Gyllenhaal is in the news this week because of the fact that um, the idea of him possibly playing Batman has come up also, and uh, concerning the fact that we are still waiting to see from James Gunn exactly who our next Batman is going to be for uh, Batman: Brave and the Bold. Richson, so uh, you were right. Rich Richson. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I I kind of I kind of dig the idea of Alan. I think just after seeing him as Hawk in Titans, I'm like, yeah, I could see him in a cape and cowl for sure, easily. Um, but Jake Gyllenhaal has brought up his name this week, uh, and I thought it was a pretty interesting one. Somebody did have the opportunity to sit down with him and ask him about it um, while he was promoting uh, Roadhouse, uh, and this is what he had to say. Let me go ahead and pull this up here for you guys. This comes to us from a screen rant saying uh, Jake Gyllenhaal gives candid response to playing Batman in the DCU. Uh, he says, speaking of screen rant at an event uh, for his new movie, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal got candid about playing um, Batman. Uh, when asked if he was interested in continuing his physical role in Roadhouse by playing Batman, Gyllenhaal showed his admiration for the character of Bruce Wayne and Batman's long movie history. Um, he goes on to say, um, this is the question that they had for him. If I can pull this up here. Why is my internet just acting all funky today, man? Like, it just keeps dropping on me. Not dropping on me, but it just keeps going from paragraph like to paragraph. Stuff. No, not so that. It just keeps, like, jumping over what I'm trying to. There we go. So Screen Rant says, um, uh, Jake, watching you in these action scenes was absolutely incredible. Like I said, it was deliciously visceral. But a while back, I know that you auditioned for the role of Batman. 
And I got some Batman vibes in this film when you were beating the crap out of people. Is that a role you'd be interested in, especially after doing a movie like this? And he says, oh, man, that's a classic. It's an honor. Speaking of playing roles that are other that other incredible actors have played in the past, to me, actually roles that other incredible actors have played. Um, when I think about it, uh, I'm going to play. Iago and Othello with uh, Denzel Washington. And I think about the history of actors that have played that role throughout time. I'm intimidated by that. So that's the first level. That's what I'm working on right now. But of course, it would be an honor always. Uh, those types of things, those roles are classics. So um, he definitely understands just sort of the weight of having a role like that. Um, I, I do appreciate the way that he's kind of looking at it in the sense of like if you look down the plethora of actors that have played Batman, you know, Michael Keaton, Val Kilmer, George Clooney, Christian Bale, um, Ben Affleck. I mean, uh, you know, there are some big stars uh, in this uh, that uh, have gotten an opportunity to play that role. And I don't know why I feel like I've. I feel like personally I've heard um, Jake Gyllenhaal having auditioned for the role of Batman and maybe having lost it. I don't know if he did it as early as like the, the Batman or maybe if it was Christopher Nolan's Batman or whatever the case may be. Or maybe even Zack Snyder's. I don't know which role he actually tried to um, – um, he tried to audition for, but clearly it's something that he's interested in. And he definitely clarifies that towards the end of um, uh, end of that quote. So there is an aspect of me that really admires how he views sort of the Batman role, the idea of him looking at it very much like as an iconic role that um, I don't want to say necessarily would like launch launch your career because Jake Gyllenhaal has had one of the, <laughs> the, the best, you know, an amazing career himself. But I think he understands um, the weight that comes with it. Um, and um, just to be able to be in sort of that same category of those other great actors that have played that role, I think certainly means a lot to him. That definitely feels like the mentality that he certainly has in here. I haven't had the opportunity to see him in Roadhouse as of yet, but I love the um, the interviewer mentioned the idea of like he got Batman vibes from this role. So maybe I'm definitely going to have to go ahead and certainly check it out. I know Jake Gyllenhaal has certainly gotten shape for this role. That's for sure. Uh, the man is shredded in here. I think he even faces off against um um conor mcgregor in here too if i'm not mistaken um you know look jake gyllenhaal is also in his 40s i think he's like in his early 40s maybe 42 or 43 years old right now i am kind of curious as to the age range that somebody like a james gunn would certainly want for their batman you know when he has mentioned the idea of batman brave and the bold we are going to be getting introduced to sort of like the bat family uh and damian wayne as well um, and so, you know, the idea of Jake Gyllenhaal coming in in his early 40s, possibly discovering he's got a son, maybe in his like early, like his preteens, if you will. Um, I would be pretty interested to kind of see what he can do with that role. Um, I guess if there is a fear that I have, I do wonder, well, I was going to say, is he too recognizable of a name? Like, would I be able to see Bruce Wayne uh, and Batman, or when I see him on screen, while well, I just think of Jake Gyllenhaal, you know, that might have been a worry that I had for somebody like um, a Ben Affleck. But I, I, I love Ben Affleck as Batman. I thought he was incredible in that role, uh, and he never took me out of that role whatsoever. And so I do think Jake is certainly talented enough to certainly do this. My my only question I think I would have at this point is. Is he too old? And again, at coming in at early 40s, I don't think that he would be because I do think that if you need him to pull off maybe a little bit of a younger Bruce Wayne, uh, I think he might be able to do that also, like in his mid 30s, if you asked him to. So, you know, I'd be open to it. I, I don't know if Stuart, I don't know if there's been any actor so far that has put their name in the hat that I'm just thinking to myself, no. Like I, I that I would not be open to it. I think there's a lot of great talent out there. And look, Alan and Jake, they 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 may be the two that I know of. I would be kind of curious if there's anybody else that's currently self campaigning to be Batman. But um, Jake Gyllenhaal putting his name in the hat, I think for me, probably gets the one up on Alan just because he's a more recognizable name. But um, 
you know, we'll see what happens when it comes to James Gunn's DCU. I think it can go certainly any direction if he wants a more recognizable person uh, or somebody like Alan that I think while people probably have seen him, I'm, I don't know any big movies that Alan has certainly been in. I definitely know him more from like the TV and streaming side of things. Um, but maybe a, a fresher, fresher face uh, when it comes to the Dark Knight will certainly do it. But uh, I'm kind of curious uh, in regards to your thoughts on this one, Stuart. Well, it's funny you mentioned uh, movies with Alan because he was actually in the most recent uh, Fast and Furious movie with uh, Jake uh, with uh, Jason Momoa. So you had yes. two Aquaman <laughs> in the movie wow. together. <laughs> Did they fight in the ocean at all on a beach scene or anything? Oh, if only that, that would have been perfect fan service right there. <laughs> um, but yeah, like uh, I think honestly, either of these two would kill it in the role. Um, they would definitely bring two very different takes on the character of uh, Bruce Wayne. Um, I don't see, I don't see a, a movie with a script with either of them in, uh, in mind looking the same. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like if you write yeah, a script totally. knowing that Alan's going to be Batman, you're going to write it very differently than if you do that, knowing that Jake Gyllenhaal is going to be your Batman. Totally. Um, totally. But I think either of them would absolutely kill it. But if I'm a betting man, and uh, this is just me going just how, you know, studios tend to overthink things. I would assume that they wouldn't want someone like Jake Gyllenhaal only because he looks and kind of his uh, overall acting style is a bit too similar to uh, Robert Pattinson. And I feel like they would want to really make sure that that audiences uh, know that these are two very different Batman. And so I think that if you had an actor like Alan, no one would be confused. Like everyone would go into this movie knowing, oh, okay, this is a completely different Batman, completely different universe from the one with Robert Pattinson. Whereas if you had Jake Gyllenhaal as a Batman in a movie, you might have those audience uh, people watching the movie and going, Oh, and so is this a sequel to the Batman movie? Just Bruce Wayne's older in this? Um, so I, I personally think they're going to try to go with someone who looks and just acts nothing like Robert Pattinson. Uh, but my personal opinion, I think either of them would kill it. And yeah, I, I do think you make a, a great point there. And I think that's a point that we try and tell people a lot of the times when they get into sort of like their fan casting mentality, right? Like when we have an idea of who we think would be perfect for a particular role and then we're not, then when they're not cast, we tend to kind of get upset and be like, Oh, this movie's going to fail now because you didn't get this person or they didn't like the choice personally, but it, it all comes down to the script, right? Like it all comes down to what version or what type of Batman are you looking for? And maybe you're right. Maybe, the idea of a Jake Gyllenhaal Batman may not line up necessarily with what James Gunn's DCU Batman, you know, script for Brave and the Bull that he might have in mind. Maybe somebody like Alan probably works a little bit better in that regards for him, too. So you're absolutely right. It is certainly going to all kind of come down to the script. But um, I, I would agree with you. I think based off of the type of Batman that James might want to go with, um, I can easily see both of those men certainly doing their fair share. And to be fair to Alan, you know, I haven't seen exactly like the depths of his acting um, as of right now. Like I, I personally have not watched Reacher, but from the people that I have that I know that have watched it, they've been pretty impressed with it. Um, they've been really impressed with what Alan is certainly bringing to the screen. Um, sometimes I wonder, like, is he is he too jacked? But then I just looked at Ben Affleck. And, you know, and, and Batman and that man was huge. I mean, he was, he was <laughs> gigantic. So, um, you know, I, I would love to have seen Ben Affleck in his prime uh, next to Alan and see who was actually bigger uh, during that time. But I, I loved again. I love what he did in Titans, at least season, at least season one of Titans. I didn't really care for him in season two so much. Uh, he did kind of have a little bit of a better comeback for me in season three. Um, so the fact that I've seen this man as a superhero before, uh, well, several times, I think we've seen him as a superhero, but somebody in a cape and cowl, um, you know, I'll, I'll give Alan the benefit of the doubt also, but I definitely want to check out, uh, Reacher and just kind of see what his range as far as an actor certainly goes. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Um, but let's know your guys' thoughts. Um, Jake Gyllenhaal has auditioned for Batman before. 
seemingly very much looks at that role as sort of a, a classic role when it comes to film and cinema in general and seemingly has an eye on it. Um, is Jake Gyllenhaal in the running? Is that somebody that you would personally like to see? Maybe you have your own actor that you would like to see in that role of Batman. I definitely would love to know your guys' thoughts in the comment section box below. And if you guys know of anybody else that is um, – fan campaigning or has thrown their name in the hat that we're not aware of um go ahead and let it be known in the comment section box below we'd love to uh, kind of look that up and see what some of my, our possible other options are and who knows maybe james gunn ain't even looking at any of them Stuart. Mm -hmm. yeah that is true uh i do love that james gunn is kind of being smart uh about this and not saying anything like when it comes to people like saying oh this person is confirmed as batman because the moment james gunn tries to go this is not true people are going to be like oh, he didn't say that about jake gyllenhaal <laughs> he didn't say that about alan which means clearly they're going to be batman <laughs> yeah i mean james gunn i think knows when to put his voice out there for sure uh, or and when to kind of keep quiet. Um, so I think he's been I think he's been doing a pretty good job in that regards. Um, mm -hmm. Johnny Marrero, he says, um, honestly, I think Gordon Cor Cormer, uh, who played Ang from uh, The Last Airbender, would make a great Robin slash Damian Wayne. What do you think? Uh -huh. I'd want to see a little bit more from him, but yes, uh, he did do a pretty good job with uh, Aang, and I definitely do see a lot of potential in what he could do. So, yeah, I'd, I'd want to see like an audition tape first, but yeah. Yeah, I would have to see an audition tape first or see more of him. You know, To be fair, I still haven't finished The Last Airbender. I think I've only done the first two episodes. I mean, he definitely hits the emotional beats uh, for an actor that I – like. Even seeing him be emotional in the first episode kind of had me a little bit choked up in the idea of him realizing like all this responsibility being bared down on him. And he just wants to be a kid. You know, he just wants to be a, a regular person and enjoy his friends and stuff like that was a pretty impressive scene for a kid so young. But again, the, the first two episodes performance and acting wise sometimes can feel a little bit wooden to me. Um, and so I, I probably would need to see a little bit more from him look wise. Absolutely. I mean, I've even seen this guy on like a late night talk show with a bow staff, like doing some incredible stuff. So I know it's like talent wise, he could definitely hold his own as a Damian Wayne. My thing would just be, can he deliver performance wise, especially being a kid so young. So we'll see though. Yeah. We'll see what he has in mind. And and like the big thing too is that like Aang and Dam Damian Wayne are two very, very, very different characters. So he may be able to do a good job as Aang, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that Damian Wayne is a whole different like type of uh, performance. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and with that out of the way, uh, let's go ahead and dive into our mm -hmm. next topic. Um, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts on Batman in the comment section box below. And we're going to stay in the realm of DC. And this is going to be an interesting story, Stuart, because I already feel like people are kind of on the fence about this upcoming film. And that is Joker 2 or Joker Fole Adu, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, you know, I think for myself, I've been pretty open to the idea of like, look, I'm a sucker for a good musical. You know, shoot me. I like me a good musical from time to time. Um, I do think we got two incredible talented actors in here and Joaquin Phoenix and Lady Gaga, two great performers that can clearly sing and perform. I mean, we had Joaquin Phoenix in Walk the Line as Johnny Cash. I mean, we've seen Lady Gaga in several movies kind of, you know, do her own singing and performing and her own acting and stuff. So we definitely know that they can hold their own. But the idea of them doing this film together as a musical in Joker 2 does have some people certainly alarmed. Um, and despite maybe some of the things that we've heard in the past, a lot of people have been asking, like, how much of a musical is this actually going to be? Like, is there a story here? We've heard Todd Phillips and, and, and Joaquin Phoenix themselves say, look, we really don't want to necessarily do a sequel for Joker unless there's a story to be told, unless we certainly have something to do there. I think we were kind of under the impression that this movie wind up making a billion dollars. There's no way Warner Brothers was not going to do some sort of sequel for this, even though we probably all thought this should be sort of a one off. But we're here now. Um, and a lot of questions still continue to be um, surrounding this particular film. And uh, this week we got a little bit more insight that for some people might encourage them for some people might. uh Make it a little bit more hesitant for you as to how you feel about this film. But this comes to us from Variety.com. Uh, Joker 2 musical details revealed 
at least 15 cover songs. Um, and original tracks may be added. So clearly they're going to be diving into popular songs that we've that we've heard probably on the radio or on streaming over the years. Um, the idea of them maybe doing an original track here or there is pretty fascinating to me. But it says 15 cover songs. And, you know, I thought we literally just did an um, I don't know. It might have been a couple of months ago, maybe where somebody had come out. Maybe I think it was a cinematographer was like, well, it's not quite a musical. Um, and I'm just thinking to myself, okay, well, if he says that, how many musical numbers are we getting? Are we getting like two musical numbers, maybe three musical numbers? But then when you tell me there's 15 cover songs in here, like how many musical performances are we really going to get? And so I, I'm, I'm interested in this. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Um, it says the Joker and Harley Quinn are set to serenade audiences in Joker 2, but if and how many original songs will be included in the film is a mystery. Insiders privy to filmmaking and early versions of Todd Phillips' eagerly awaited sequel to Joker tell Variety the movie leans heavily towards being mostly a jukebox musical. Um, as it integrates at least 15 reinterpretations of very well-known songs, one is said to be that's entertainment from the 1953's musical The Bandwagon, famously associated with Judy Garland. However, there is a door open for an original song or two to be added in the final version. Details regarding who would pen the tracks or sing the numbers are unknown. We do know that according to sources... Um, the Oscar winning composer for the first Joker is said to infuse her distinctive haunting music cues into each number. So it does seem like we're going to be getting some sort of level of twisted um, kind of maybe versions of some of these pretty well-known songs. And I guess if you think of Harley Quinn and Joker, that probably feels um, rather appropriate. It says jukebox musicals known for featuring popular songs often achieve box office success. Examples include Mamma Mia and Moulin Rouge. Um, the latter actually received eight Oscar nominations. Uh, uh, Joker 2 is expected to break the mold of traditional musicals. Uh, specific details about the plot of Foley Adu have not been officially confirmed, but the film is described as a drama with elements taking place in and around Arkham Asylum. Uh, alongside Joaquin Phoenix and Gaga, uh, the cast include Emmy, Emmy nominee Zaza Beats. Um, and as well as other Oscar nomination uh, nominees, Catherine Keener and Brand Brandon Gleason. I didn't know Brandon Gleason was in here. I really like him actually. Um, yeah, it. We also have to remember that Variety reported that the budget of the sequel is going to be near two hundred million dollars, a significant jump from the sixty million dollar tag of the original as well. Um, so yeah, man, this is going to be interesting, Stuart. Um. You know, I I had never actually heard of the term jukebox musical before, so I am kind of glad that they at least included some of the names of some of the well-known ones. I'm pretty sure there are probably other jukebox musical ones that I've um I've seen, but just never even um, knew what they were considered. But you know, the idea of it saying that it usually leads to a lot of Oscar success or a lot of um, box office success, I think that certainly might be why they decided to go this route and to be fair when i come to think about it like i almost i almost would rather them go that route than more original sort of music um i think one because the music will be extremely recognizable for people people could probably sing along if they certainly wanted to even though it's going to have its own distinct different beats to it if you will but um i i just think having to write original tracks for the musical i don't want to say would not feel necessarily the same for a joker joker sequel or feel like not as in tune for both joker and harley but i don't know when i think of these two characters the idea of a jukebox of like popular songs that have been out there that they can mold and kind of shape to kind of feature and talk about their distinct sort of love together i think might actually make people feel a little bit more connected if that makes any sense compared to doing more originals um, because if you go the route of songs that are very familiar with people i think there's an uh, an instant sort of 
emotional tie that the, the viewer certainly gets. And then when you tie that to the both psychopathic lovers in here of Joker and Harley, I think that in itself would actually make it uh, a, a distinct take as well. So, you know, look, I, I still don't know how to feel about this movie. I, I'm very fascinated. I'm very interested and curious about it, but, um, I'm trying to remember if Joker 2 made my most anticipated list or if it was like an I think it might have been like an honorable mention for me. Um, but I am looking forward to it just to kind of see, like, can they really pull off a Joker 2 um, in this way? But um, you hear this, Stuart, 15 cover songs. Clearly, they're going to put their own distinct sort of twist on these songs. Are you worried? Are you concerned? Is that a lot of songs Do you think they're going to maybe mesh up like two or three songs into like one musical piece sort of thing. Uh, how are you taking this news? Man, <clears throat> I'm assuming it's not going to be the full songs for all 15 of these, but because wow, even for a musical 15 is a it lot. Sounds, yeah. It sounds like a lot. Yeah. Uh, but I'm assuming that they're going to be very like shortened versions of these songs for, for the most part. Um, yeah. I mean, Jukebox musicals, uh, I'm not usually the biggest fan of. Uh, like Mamma Mia, for instance, uh, the the girl I was dating at the time tried to get me to uh, watch it with her. Uh, I think that was one of the few movies I like couldn't even get through because I was just I did not like it at all. And then Moulin Rouge, I enjoyed, and I'm sure a lot of people enjoy that movie. But I think that even people who enjoy it will admit that eh, it's not the best written movie out there. <laughs> but you know. I think with this, though, with characters like Joker and Harley Quinn, kind of like what you were mentioning when you were reading the article, is uh, th they're probably going to have their own, like, really twisted interpretations of these songs. And I think that's really interesting. You hear a lot about how, like, you know, songs will have a very specific message. They, they're they saying something very specific, and yet what we feel, what we get from it could be something completely different than what the uh, artist who wrote the song intended. So... I like that we can get that, but now it's two like absolute psychopaths. Like uh, I, I would love to see them take like a song that's supposed to be super innocent, something that's supposed to represent happiness, and then just find a complete way to just turn it into a song about misery. It feels like if any movie can do that, it's it's or if anyone can do that, it's someone like the Joker and uh, Harley Quinn. Yeah, no, I I I totally agree with you, and I think that's probably. The one aspect of it being a, a jukebox musical that could actually maybe really make it work. Um, I was just looking up Screen Rant to see like other well-known jukebox musicals. Uh, 10 best jukebox musicals ranked by Rotten Tomatoes at least. They have the animated movie Sing back in 2016. Actually oh, enjoyed yeah. that. Actually enjoyed that one. Uh the Blues Brothers from 19 uh from 1980. Oh my god. I forgot uh, that was a jukebox musical. I haven't seen that in so long. Um they had Trolls from 2016. Moulin Rouge is up here. Um Mama Mia is also mentioned. All that jazz from 1979. Rocket Man, the 2019 of um, the Elton yeah. John one. Did you like that movie? I'm like, not? oh, I loved Rocket Man. That was that was an, an awesome movie. Um, what else did they have in here? I'm trying to think of um, Singing in the Rain in 1952. I didn't even realize that was a jukebox music. I didn't know that either. Yeah, I thought I thought those were all original. I thought those songs came from thought, that movie. I thought so too. Um, I just wanted to show you like how way before that time, our time, that movie was. Um, but yeah, I did. I had no idea. Um, so look, can it work? Absolutely. I will say I don't I don't necessarily think the idea of 15 songs and original tracks like is going to quash like anybody's uncertainty about this film, too. But um, I do think the idea of utilizing well-known songs that I think the audience can immediately connect themselves to, I think, can have a little bit of fun with the idea of seeing how they play with those songs. And like you mentioned, the lyrics and how the, some of the lyrics may take on completely different meanings, especially when it comes to Joker and Harley Quinn. And who knows, maybe we've all been in like our weird, crazy ass relationships where you're like, you know what? I, I can jive with the song even more now, now that I see Harley and Joker <laughs> singing about this, like, damn, that was been one crazy ass relationship I was in back in the day. Um, so yeah, maybe it'll have us kind of thinking about some crazy past loves of ours for all I know. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm just thinking like pacing wise, watch them just like not even edit the songs down and then use really long songs <laughs> like American Pie or Trapped in the Closet. <laughs> No, if anything, I like I in I, again 15. I, like I, I just don't see, I just don't see them being 15 musical set pieces. Like I just, I just can't imagine that. Um, so maybe it's just like you said, maybe a brief minute of Harley singing a solo thing to herself while she's thinking about Joker. You know, maybe in the next scene is like another minute. Like I, I think they could probably take some snippets and then other moments have like big you know song performances of like an entirety of one song or something like that based off of it but look i i do think this could be interesting i I think that there's a level of craziness that both harley and the joker and maybe again and i think also Stuart, you know we talked about one of the images that they dropped this one with the set design and stuff right like this feels like them just being in their heads Right, like them just being so crazy, just mentally, that they're just like in their heads when they're performing sort of all these songs and whatnot. And that is something that I find pretty appealing and I think really works when you're talking about in being in and outside of Arkham Asylum. Uh, if you're trying to see people literally crazy in love, and I gotta think that Beyonce song Crazy in Love has got to be in this movie. Um, <laughs> I, I just think of these two. And so I do think that there is something there. I just think we don't fully understand it until we're actually seeing it on screen. And we're like, this is genius. Um, But who knows, man? We'll see. Uh, Dacia does say Sing was a great one. Yeah, I I was a big fan of Sing. I haven't seen the sequel to it, but I was a big fan of that one. But look, guys, let us know your thoughts. Uh, When you hear this, 15 um, cover songs, possibly some original tracks. Um, are you still concerned about Joker? Are you, the more you think about it, are you interest kind of peaked? I kind of want to know your guys' thoughts. So let your thoughts be known in the comment section box below. And with that, Stuart, we got two more topics left. So let's go ahead and change courses. We're going to get into our movie bag. I mean, we kind of been talking about movies, but we're going to get away from sort of the comic book genre elements a little bit and talk about two movies, Stuart, growing up that uh, I was a big fan of. Uh, And this first one that we're going to highlight is one that I literally saw in the theaters again, maybe within the past five or six years. You know, I personally love when movie theaters release older movies that came out back in like the 80s and 70s and stuff that people might not have gotten the opportunity to see on the big screen, but are getting the opportunity to see it now. And I remember watching The Never Ending Story as a kid on VHS quite often. And it was a movie that I never got the opportunity to see in theaters until several years ago. And to be honest, it still looks great on the theaters, on, on a theater screen. And it's it still holds up, if you ask me um, personally. Um, but it looks as though now that so much time has passed for the never ending story, it might be time for a new generation, Stuart, to get their own never ending story story. Uh, and so we got an article here from uh, Variety.com that lets us know, hey, man. We're getting a new live action interpretations of this film, uh, and uh, we'll see how it goes. It says, uh, Never Ending Story, getting a new film series adaption from Slow Horses Banner Seesaw. This is an exclusive. And if I can also be honest with you, Stuart, I didn't even know this was originally a book. I had no clue. I had no clue. Um, I don't remember if I knew that or not. (laughs) uh, But it is getting a new series adaption. Um, it says Falcor flies again, the never ending story, the beloved fantasy novel from late German author, Michael Endy, uh, that was famously adapted into the cult 1984 film is being revived for the big screen once more with a new joint venture partnership between Michael Endy productions and prestige tastemakers, seesaw films, bringing the world of Fantastica back to cinemas over multiple live action films. Um, for those of you who don't know, we actually did get two never ending story movies back in the day. So I'm kind of curious as to how many films they plan on uh, doing for this one. It says the news brings to an end the race 
for one of the hottest fantasy properties yet to be tapped for modern audiences. Variety hears that Andy's estate had, uh, had been building interest from across the globe over the last few years, including from studios and streamers. Uh, Seesaw, no strangers to adapting well-known literature for screens, having been behind features including Lion and uh, the movie The Power of the Dog, and recent TV hits like Heartstopper and Slow Horses, has now teamed with Michael Fendi uh, Andy Productions to develop and produce the films. The new partnership has been granted the Never Ending Story rights. Um, so yeah, it looks like it's going to be happening. It does say the first uh, first published back in 1979, the Never Ending Story became a bestseller in Germany. Uh, at the center of the story is the awkward but imaginative child Bastion, who while escaping from bullies, discovers the mysterious book, The Never Ending Story, about the heroic Atreyu. Uh, I think I have a picture of Atreyu in here. Yeah. Um, and his mission to save the magical realm of Fantastica, a world of dragons, giants, vast kingdoms, and deadly swamps, and its ruler, the childlike empress, from being destroyed by force known as the nothing. But the more he reads, the more Bastion realizes he's not simply an uninvolved spectator, and he soon finds himself transported in Fantastica himself, flying atop the Luke, the excuse me, the Luck Dragon and Falcor. And I got to tell you, I think everybody uh, from their childhood or at least has always seen the meme or the picture of Bastion on Falcor. He's like, yeah, you know, like, is he flying? Um, so you, if you haven't seen the movie, you definitely know that scene. Uh, he says the story is both timely and timeless and really has the opportunity to be told in a fresh way. Uh, and part of the specialness of the book is that you can go back to it at different ages in your life and find different levels of meaning. Absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons why I even appreciated it, seeing it on theaters such a long time um, for the first time in, on the big screen. Cause I think as an adult, I definitely had a, 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 fr a fresh uh, perspective and a different meaning checking it out. He says, so how wonderful that we have this opportunity to do a fresh perspective that will have new layers and meanings. Uh, we just believe that every generation deserves their own journey into Fantastica. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I could have said it um, better myself, Stuart. Do you have um, any memories of uh, Never Ending Story? Were you a fan of the, the movie itself or what? Uh, I mean, I rented it from Blockbuster once because my sister <laughs> highly recommended it. Uh, yeah. And that I think I, I don't even think I was in middle school when I watched it. So the only thing that really sticks out in my mind, honestly, is the ending with the kid writing the, uh, as I called it, because, you know, I'm a super, super mature little kid at the time. I used to call <laughs> it the dog face flying tampon. <laughs> oh, oh, poor Falcor. <laughs> Poor Falcor. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it's like, I don't remember much about it, though. I do remember it looking really awesome. And of course, I remember that beginning bit where it was like this um, uh, older gentleman trying to tell the kid, oh, yeah, you kids, you don't know anything about books. But then the kid's like, no, I, I'm an introvert. I love books. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I, I always dug the idea of, for me personally, the idea of seeing Bastion um, reading the book uh, and then as he's reading it, having the Empress like talking to him and he's like, what? what? <laughs> like, what's going on here? Like just the, the idea. I think for me too, growing up as a kid, um, again, I always grew up a big nerd. I even found myself getting into like creative writing classes when I was um in uh in the beginning of high school sort of thing i used to love to write i don't write as much n nowhere near as much as i used to write so there was sort of like that element of being kind of like whisked away into uh you know a fantasy land sort of thing you know um and somebody even says uh one of the comments in here you know johnny says never ending story feels more like a jim, Hen jim henson production and i was always really fond of Jim Henson productions back like Dark Crystal and stuff, right? Like uh, any of the puppeteer level sort of films back in the 80s, I was always a really kind of big fan of. And so um, for me, Never Ending Story was very much like that, you know, fantastical, interesting, weird creatures and stuff. But just the idea of like being a kid, having like this bigger calling and this connection to this book and kind of being thrusted into all of a sudden be this hero. Um, 
I think if you were a kid in the 80s, um, this was a book like right up your alley or a movie right up your alley. And so it definitely sucked me in, man. It definitely sucked me in. But, I, you know, I would agree with them in the sense that every generation definitely needs a never ending story. Uh, and now that we're in, you know, the 2020s and this movie came out in the 80s. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's time for one here. So we'll see what type of uh, new interesting twists that they can certainly put on it. But I, I do think that there's going to be a a great meaning in here for for everybody mm -hmm. uh, and i feel like uh, uh younger kids are also going to be excited for it because uh even if they never watched the uh, original i'm sure because of the internet and because of stranger things they definitely have a good idea of what it is yeah and you know shout out to nathan for this comment because he's absolutely right as a kid especially like the 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 swamp sequence um and never ending story like for me was pretty terrifying like i feel like the yeah. 80s the 80s were never too light on kids at all like even jim henson productions has some weird ass terrifying creatures or like really dark scenes that gave you a hint of like wanting to pull your blanket up to your eyes you know what i'm saying like it was always a great balance and so when he says i just hope they don't make it too light and colorful it, it was kind of semi scary as a kid to keep it that way. And I totally agree. There definitely should be a sense of like danger. And as a kid, like maybe wanting to cover your eyes or peek through your eyes type of moments. Um, Cause I, I definitely had my, my fair share of like uh, moments like that for sure. In that film. Yeah. It's like uh, the guy that did land before time. What he used to say is that he can, uh, you know, terrify kids all he wants. He can make his movies as dark and gritty as he wants. As long as there's a happy ending, kids will come back to it. Yeah, but absolutely. Um, what's up? The artistic mechanics of Leon. What's up, man? Thank you so much for um, joining us here today. He says ET is one that I want to see on the big screen. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious if they've, uh, when's the last time they've re-released E.T. Um, E.T. freaks me out, so I probably will not mm -hmm. uh, be checking that out. You know, this is off a tangent. I'm sorry, but he brought up he brought up E.T. First off, my girlfriend loves the movie E.T. Um, she's 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 tried to make me watch it. I think we 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 did watch it together one time, um, but I saw I literally saw a clip back on March 16th because it was 316 day, so it was like Austin uh, Steve Austin day. If you're a big wrestling fan and I literally saw a clip of somebody dressed up in an E.T. mask. OK, he pulled up to a drive through and he ordered his food with the Steve Austin accent, like impersonation with an E.T. mask on. It was the most terrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. I wish <laughs> I never had. Crossover. <laughs> it's the weirdest crossover. E.T. sounded just like Steve Austin ordering some cheeseburgers. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen in my life. I just had to pull that up, though. Uh, Ram Jam says, I love the classic never-ending story. If you guys um want to go that go back down memory lane, go ahead and certainly check it out. Um, Definitely should keep the song since nostalgia is in right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You cannot change, uh, can't change that never-ending song. You got to keep it. Um... Although Ram just says they need to redo the theme song. No, I like it. Man. I mean, maybe give it like uh, an updated, I don't want to say updated version of it, but I think keep the same notes, man. I think you got to keep the same mm -hmm. notes. Um, he said, I hope or just have they... the two kids from uh, Stranger Things do the cover again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, he says, I hope that they use more practical effects and not as much CGI. I'm sure there's probably going to be a blend of both, but you know, to kind of go back to what he was saying, um, you know, we were just talking about like the Dark Crystal, like the Dark Crystal um, series that was on Netflix, I thought handled the idea of C uh, of practical effects with CGI relatively well. Um, I think if they can do that, then they might have something there. Uh, Blossom's a big fan. She said, did you say Never Ending Story? That's my favorite. Yeah, it's one of my favorites too, growing up as a kid. I didn't realize how old that movie was, though, honestly. She said, I related to Bastion so much. A lot of uh, fans of this movie. I, I guess I need to go rewatch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Maybe you'll have different eyes instead of looking at it as the furry dog tampon thing. You know, like maybe, you'll, <laughs> maybe you'll have a different perspective on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never poor Falcor, man. Falcor deserves some more love. I used to, I you know, I will say um, I always loved the Falcor design but i was always fascinated with like the scales that he had he it was like it was like the scales almost like of a, a snake but yet um he, he was like like a furry dog to me so it was like a 
a dog meets a snake kind of combat. I don't know what it was, but it it, it kind of worked for me a little bit. It was just a just a unique design, that's for sure. Oh yeah, I think uh, what what I always love about like some fantasy elements, especially when it's like uh, when it's like made for kids, is like you always get those really cool uh, like creatures that you know can kick a lot of ass, but they also look extremely friendly as well. So you know, as long as you're not trying to like you know hurt them or anything, like you know, they may even let you ride you, like in the case of this movie. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I love this um, comment here from um, from Blossom. He's like. Um, Oh wait, she says he's he's a dog mixed with like Asian representation of dragons. Yeah, I think that's I think yeah. that's that's exactly what it is. Um, but she had another one in here. Oh, she says, I mean, we both have an imagination that makes us seem sort of as freaks. Um, uh, because she says she can relate to Bastion in such a way. And I do think, especially like you mentioned, the idea of like us being like introverted kids, perhaps, you know, being stuck in books or having an overactive imagination sometimes, you know, we definitely be like the oddball out of certain scenes, uh, you know, of certain scenes growing up in childhood sort of thing. So I definitely oh, yes. understand that. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, guys, let us know um, your thoughts in regards to the never ending story set to return. We got some uh, live action films. I'm kind of curious. It does say multiple films. So I am curious. You think, oh, look, everything these days, Stuart, is a trilogy. You think they're going to aim for a trilogy or we, you, we may end up with just two like we did the original? Uh, probably one for each book. Uh, so if there's three books, then yeah, trilogy. Actually, <laughs> unless they try to do like what what they were doing like in the late 2000s and try to change the uh, last book into two movies, movies because for some reason that became really popular. It's like Harry Potter did it, then every franchise decided to do it afterwards. Uh, I'm trying to think. Never ending story two. I do remember seeing that one. It had that um. I don't remember. Yeah, Falcor was in it again. I think Atreyu was in it. I don't remember that one as much. Um, was that like that might have been like a '90s? Was that a, the '90s? Um, maybe when it came out. I don't remember. It felt like a '90s film to me, like an early '90s film to me. But I, I have to look up the date of that one. If you guys remember a Never Ending Story too, let me know. Yeah, like no idea because for me, I didn't even know it existed until I started watching uh, the Nostalgia Critic back in the day. Oh, that's how you came across it? Yeah, because I think that was like one of his movie reviews. And I'm like, that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, sticking with the theme of nostalgia and going back to some of our childhood, um, another movie is getting a live action film. One that has had a live action film before, um, but it's been quite some time. Um, you know. Again, I, I continue to show my age around here because I was born in 82. So I literally just turned 41 this past December. Um, but I feel like for me growing up in the 80s, uh, I grew up with some of the best cartoons, I feel like. Um, I'm sure every generation probably feels they had the best cartoons. But I, I was always a big fan. Uh, and I think also back in the 80s, you know, we had a lot of access to like older cartoon series too. You know what I mean? Like um, the Hanna Barbera stuff was certainly still around. I mean, we had you know cartoons that would still come on from like you know the Tom and Jerry and stuff. I don't even know when those came up, but I mean, some cartoons from like the late forties, you know, early fifties. You know, that type of stuff was still relatively accessible on regular television. But one of the cartoons that I always grew up with, Stuart, um, was Popeye. Um, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Okay. Um, <laughs> it was the only thing that got me to eat spinach back in the day because uh, homeboy wanted to become big and strong like Popeye. I think it was a great way for kids to eat your vegetables back in the day. But uh, I used to love this cartoon. Um, and one day I came across a live action version of Popeye played by none other than good old Robin Williams himself. And uh, I got to tell you, um, I never thought that they'd be able to bring Popeye to life. And as campy as this movie was, I, I ate it up, Stuart. I ate this movie up back in the 80s, uh, especially as a kid fresh off of um, enjoying a bunch of uh, Popeye cartoons. 
Well, you know what? Rest in peace, Robin Williams, for this incredible performance that he did. Like, if there's anybody that could play Popeye, it just 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 his personality alone, his performances, how quirky he could he could certainly be. I mean, the one the the whole one eye thing, like Popeye too. I mean, the guy just embodied Popeye as much as you possibly could ask for. And I I personally can't imagine anybody else pulling off something like this. But guys. We're getting another Popeye live action film. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into this. This actually comes to us from uh, IGN here, according to a new report from Variety. It says, uh, while details are slim, Variety reports the film is in collaboration um, with the owner of Popeye IP, King Features. Uh, the former uh, is a film production company that worked with uh, Rupert Wyatt's 2011 movie Rise of the Planet of the Apes. The report calls the move a big budget feature with Michael Caleo, whose screenwriting credits include Paramount's plus crime drama Sexy Beast in one episode of The Sopranos, set to write the script. Uh, Popeye is a pop culture icon known as the one-eyed sailor with a cleft chin and a pipe in their mouth. While the character has a muscular physique, his forearms uh, grow significantly every time he consumes a can of spinach. While Popeye first appeared in the comic strip in the late 1920s, the character has popped up in various ways over the last several decades, from comic book movies uh, to comic books to video games and cartoons, the most notable being the adaption based on the character back in the 1980s film um, for Popeye. Uh, it says this is the latest attempt to bring Popeye to the big screen since the 1980 film. Um, in 2020, it was announced that the King Features was reviving the project, but it would suffer the same fate with the uh, footage, with the footage leaked online. What there was a footage leak online? Maybe I have to. Yeah, look. they had like a, a teaser, I remember, and it was pretty funny. Uh, but yeah, never. Unfortunately, yeah, never went beyond that. Um, so there's no like window as to when this would happen. Um, there's no like release date that they certainly have in mind for this. Um, I thought I had the, uh, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to pull up the, um, I'm trying to pull up the actual variety article, but, uh, I'm not getting any further details than that. Also, um, it says Popeye celebrated the 95th anniversary this year after appearing in the 1929 comic. Um, that's pretty crazy how long this character has certainly been around. But um, yeah, man, a new Popeye is certainly in, is certainly here. And shout out to Shelley Duvall um, also, who played a magnificent olive oil. Um, you probably recognize her from The Shining uh, and other films as well. But um, Shelley Duvall, I think, <laughs> I think she was made for this role. To be quite frank with you, like I I could not have imagined anybody else playing olive oil. She was already tall and extremely lanky like olive oil was taller almost taller than popeye himself in the uh, which he always was in the in the cartoons um and i thought she just played this uh, miraculously well um there was a goofiness about this movie there was a charm about this movie there was a fun little romance between popeye and olive oil that really worked in here and the action sequences i thought were really brilliant and how they wind up kind of bringing this together um, do we need a Popeye the Sailor movie, M M Sailor Man the movie? Probably not. But um, especially after the late great Robin Williams, I don't know who else could pull this off. I didn't think um, Will Smith could pull off the genie either. And I think he made the genie his own, um, you know, really separating himself certainly from Robin Williams. But I would be interested to see, if anything, who they would even cast for this role. Because I think the, I think the important thing here, Stuart, is you can't have somebody that just comes in as already jacked. Mm -hmm. and, and, but the, but then again, I don't think he needs to be like super scrawny either. But I mean, the idea is this man eats a spinach, pops open a can of spinach, whoop, and then he grows muscles. <laughs> um, so I am kind of curious who they would get to kind of play this. Uh, but what are your thoughts? Have you seen the 1980s Popeye movie? If so, do you have any fond memories of it? And what the idea of them doing a live action Popeye now? Um, what do you think about it? Man, you know, I've actually never seen a live action Popeye movie. <laughs> you got to check uh, it out now, Stuart. 
I, I, I definitely do. Uh, now, especially now knowing that they're uh, going for a, another live action Popeye. Uh, but I love the cartoon. Uh, let me, let me just uh, heavily emphasize that. I absolutely love the Popeye cartoon. Uh, the animation was freaking amazing. And then of course, if you look at the background art, um, specifically when it got into color, cause I actually don't think I've watched any of the black and white episodes. The episodes uh, I watched were all so in either. color. Um, but like, oh my gosh, the backgrounds looked absolutely incredible. And the fact that I remember that, even though I haven't watched it since I was a kid, and usually that kind of stuff didn't like stick out to me at the time, that, that just shows you how much work really went into to it back in the day. Um, so I love Popeye. I don't know how I feel about a live action movie being in development for it. Um, like, Obviously, you know, I don't hate the idea. It clearly worked once in the 80s and technology to make these type of uh, projects has only gotten better. So theoretically, it should work. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I can't really say I'm excited for the project, if, if I'm being honest. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm kind of right there with you. I mean, like, I think from a nostalgia point of view, I'm like, oh, that's cool that they're possibly going to tackle this again. But again, do I feel like I need a Popeye the Sailor live action movie? Like, no, like I, I got it. I think Robin Williams really knocked it out of the park as best as you could, especially in the 80s. Um, I am kind of curious, like, do what the, the current generation of people even know who the hell Popeye the Sailor Man is these days? I mean, I think he's still an iconic figure in regards to, like, if you see him, people probably would might recognize him. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. I guess for me, Robin Williams did it so well. I'm trying to think of who's out there that can just do a great impersonation and like sort of make it their own. Um, maybe if they eventually reveal an actor for it, maybe I might be open to it, but I don't, you know, I, I'm, I think it's the nostalgia that's certainly hitting me right now. And just thinking of like the fond memories that I have of the original film, you know, it, it is fascinating too. When I bring up, um, I did find this Hollywood reporter article from back in 2020 that was celebrating, uh, the 40th anniversary of the movie itself. And they have a couple of interesting tidbits in here. They say um, Dustin Hoffman was actually supposed to play the lead. Um, but he apparently wanted the actor or the writer off the project. And uh, and instead, um, they sided with the writer and replaced Hoffman with Robin Williams after he was the breakout star of uh, Mork and Mindy. I have uh, I have heard that Dustin Hoffman was one of the actors that's just a huge pain in the ass to uh, work with. So that does really? not surprise me at all. Yeah, uh, he, it's like Chevy. He's basically similar to Chevy Chase in the fact that like um, to uh, uh, this is all from what I hear. Obviously, I've not met the person in real life. So for all I know, maybe he's a good guy. But from what I hear, he's like Chevy Chase, where it's like the fame really went to his head. And then suddenly he thinks that like because he's really talented, he gets final say in everything very uh entitled is is the word i'm looking for <laughs> no i get you they also say that they shot this movie in malta far from the eyes of executives at disney and paramount which uh, shared the costs the island nation was virtually no indigenous wood it's all solid rock so tons were imported to create the uh sweet haven set um oh. They said constant rain led the shoot to run two months over schedule, during which there were multiple creative squabbles. Uh, when it finally opened December 6th of 1980s, uh, critics were underwhelmed. Um, the Hollywood Reporter called it one of the major disappointments of the season. Still, the $20 million picture made $50 million domestically, which due to inflation today, $157 million and has since gained a loyal following. It was a good little movie with some major talents done with very little money. Um, all the rest is bullshit, is what the, uh, one of the creators said. Um, but it's right. It, it, to me, it's it's one that uh, I definitely remember fondly, certainly as a child. Some really great memories, man. Uh, again, having a big, being a big fan of the move of the cartoon and seeing it turn into live action, I honestly think they knocked it out of the park. Um, so I, I guess it, it shows you just how much time um, for certain movies can really change uh, people's perspective on them for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like the uh, the Flintstones uh, movie because I remember, well, not remember because I you know wasn't around when it came out, but back in the day, critics absolutely hated it and like uh, everyone thought it was just gonna die at the box office. But and it kind of did. I don't think it did financially too well at the box office. But you know, home release came and then suddenly people were like, "Wait, no, this movie's actually pretty good." <laughs> I do remember seeing the first Flintstones in movie theaters. I think as a, I can't remember how old I was, but I, I think I enjoyed it at the time, but it was probably definitely for my age range at that time. Oh yeah. Um, Blossom says uh, Popeye is one of my favorite cartoons. Uh, Robin was an amazing Popeye. Uh, Ram Jim says the eighties were a fun time. Yeah, they were, man. Yeah, they were. Um, Nathan says interesting to see what they do. Um, he says, I never got why Bluto and Popeye, Fought over Olive. Yeah, fucking Bluto. He always wanted a piece of Olive for sure. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Blossom says, did you know Olive's family is named after oils? She says, Nana oil, castor oil, and diesel oil. No way. Get out of here. That's hilarious. That's That's hilarious. I never knew that. (laughs) That's so funny. (laughs) That's so great. Um, but yeah, guys, look, let us know your thoughts. Do you have any fond memories of the 1980s Popeye Robin Williams film? Maybe you've never even seen it before. Uh, if you want to go down memory lane, I highly recommend uh, you guys certainly check it out for yourself. It's campy to certainly say the least, but I think you'll be impressed with what Robin Williams manages uh, to pull off for sure. Um, but, I'd be uh, yeah, disinterested guys. if it wasn't campy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, but yeah, guys, let us know your thoughts in the comment section box below. And with that out of the way, movies I gotta watch. <laughs> yeah, man, put that on your put that. I wonder if they're anywhere on streaming. Um, I would be kind of curious if we can find them on streaming anywhere. But um, do I got you for a live viewer question, Stuart? You do indeed. Awesome. So uh, let's get into our final segment of the night. Now, everybody, it is time for live viewer questions, questions, questions. And if you uh, ever want to go ahead and send us a live viewer question, uh, if you have to ask Adam, how do I do that? Um, Very simple. We'll go ahead and show you right here right now. Um, So just simply always go over to our, oh, well, you know what? That's the wrong page. Duh, Adam. Uh, Here we go. This is the page. So just go over to our YouTube page like so. Um, every Saturday evening, uh, we will go ahead and post a, uh, a post for you guys. Just click on community as you see right here and voila live viewer questions. Uh, and today we got nine questions, Stuart. Damn. They coming through with the wow. questions tonight. Uh, let's see how this uh, works out for us. Uh, go ahead and shuffle these around a little bit and we'll start from the bottom. Now we're here. Here we go. Um, Peg C is in the house. What's up, Ram Jam? Do you remember when Zordon laid out the three basic rules of the Power Ranger oaths? Never use your power for personal gain. Never escalate a battle unless Rita forces you. Keep your identity a secret. No one may know you are a Power Ranger. Thank you for mm-hmm. reminding me. It's uh, it's why like anyone, uh, anytime someone brings up, well, why don't they just use the Zords from the start? It's like, that's one of the rules <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely um and then two have you seen the two episode premiere of x-men 97 and if so what did you think um and real quick for those of you who do not know indy is doing our reviews for x-men 97 he did go ahead and post his two episode review up on our youtube channel go ahead and check it out man support his work Check out his thoughts on it. Hit that like button for that video also. Um, but we haven't had the opportunity to talk X-Men 97, Stuart. Um, you look pretty eager to dive into it, man, and give your thoughts. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, I love it so far. I just you know finished the first two episodes. I got to check out Indy's review because I'm curious what he has to say. Uh, my favorite thing about it, though, they, they were able to take that soap opera-y like, uh, 90s dialect the standard for the time when it came to Saturday morning cartoons. They brought that back, but they weren't late 
like it's so funny how the dialogue is somehow both campy but also really brilliant like at the same time like this is like a kind of incredibly written show so far i know we're only two episodes in but already i just really want to applaud the writing staff for the dialogue because wow i i would never be able to pull something like that off i would be able to give you really campy or something that can make you think i can't do both in the way that they do in the uh, 97 uh you know reboot series you know when i when i watch episode one episode one is all nostalgia for me it feels very much like the classic saturday morning cartoon that i used to watch you know really cool that they even introduced sunspot to us i thought that was a brilliant move also i hope he comes i hope he comes back in the rest of the series you know great action i mean it felt like man i'm back to my saturday morning x-men cartoon so i i absolutely ate it up i loved it episode two just like it injected me with something that just like just took my expectations like through the effing roof <laughs> Um, it was incredibly deep. Uh, I loved, I like you, I loved the writing in it. Um, it's like the Saturday morning on steroids. The, the dialogue was brilliant. The well thought out, um, character growth, getting the opportunity to see what happened at storm was like, Oh my God, what's going to happen to storm this whole season? Oh my God. The, um, growth of Magneto. Um, and like the lesson that he winds up teaching, like it feels like a Saturday morning lesson, but just like in 2020, like a, a mm -hmm. very modern take on a, a classic storyline. And it just feels so much more mature than I don't want to say than I was expecting, but it's it's more mature than I, even I was expecting. And I think they they pull it off so brilliantly um, where it feels like you said, it feels like that classic Saturday morning cartoon, but it's like, uh, yeah, it's, I don't know how to explain it. It just, it blew me away. It really blew me away. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even want to get into this, but like, I, I laugh at people that, feel some type of way about the first two episodes already you know and i mean that in a sense of like this whole wokeness shit you know what i'm saying but it's like when i watch the episode like that's not even like i don't even get that feeling like i don't even get that sense i feel like i can easily correlate what's happening in the story to a more modern time but I never, it never feels forced upon me. You know, it mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's that blatant and in your face, unless you're truly taking the time to like overthink what they're talking about. And, and like for me, just the notion of like seeing Magneto having to put up with like the hypocrisy of humans, you know, wanting to, um, to to have some sort of peace but yet they are doing these things that are hurting like a whole entire society of people and then like and then magneto having to come to terms with the idea like normally bro i would just kill you right now and the fact that i'm even like holding myself back to you know fulfill the wishes of my dead my dead friends last wishes and stuff like it is just the storytelling is just on a whole nother level that just makes you appreciate um, not only what we got, but I, I just think just it just makes me appreciate how these stories handled my childhood as a kid and like the values that they infused in me as a child and it feels like they are continuing to build upon those values of us as a, a human society in general and just the concept of being better to each other in the sense of um instead of bringing each other down being fearful because of the fact that we're different and they do it in such a great way of it being just that mutant world that is just, it still has those parallels to us as a society, even more powerfully though this time without being too much in your face, if that makes sense. 
And I just think the monologue, especially with what Magneto does towards the end and what he says to the, the judges and the council before him, just super impactful, man. And I think even the animation itself took like a, 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 even a bigger leap in episode two than it did in episode one. Um, but it, it just blew me away, Stuart. I was I was really floored when I checked out episode two. I did not expect them to get that deep on me, but they did. Yeah, I'll, I'll be careful because uh, if, if I'm not careful, I'll go on way too long, but I'll be as fast as possible. But because um, you brought up like certain people that are hating it already, uh, you know, claiming that, that it's like too woke and all that. Um, something I really love about this is that, you know, much like the original X-Men, uh, you know, whether people want to admit it or not, you know, like the original X-Men cartoon, it is a show that is meant to speak to everyone who feels like an outcast in one way or another, whether it's because of color, sexuality, or even just, uh, you know, maybe you just have something mentally or physically that, you know, makes you different from other, you know, people like you. Um, so the show, no matter why you feel like an outcast, it's supposed to connect to you. And that's why like you know in the 90s show they're very vague on you know what metaphorically these things can mean and i like how they keep that here um one it, thing absolutely. that yeah one thing one thing that could have easily made the writing come off as way too on the nose is like i was kind of expecting someone to hold a sign up that says uh something along the lines of mutant lives matter or uh you know stop the mutant hate or something where it's just like okay that's a bit too direct you know right. kind of uh -huh. takes me out of it in that sense but they don't do that they you know the, the metaphors are still there. They, you know, you can connect to it no matter what it is that makes you feel like, you know, uh, marginalized, no matter what it is, you can find a reason to connect with, uh, you know, a lot of these characters, they keep that. And so that's why it blows me away that you still have YouTubers claiming that it's too woke for them. I'm sorry, but if this show is too woke for you at this point, everything is too woke for you all right <laughs> yeah for real i mean it's the same it's the same story that they said that they told back in the 90s it's the same exact yes. thing it's just you know it's it's amazing to me it's amazing to me um but I, I i agree with you it's it's not too on the nose but the metaphors are certainly still there and they're just as impactful as they were before if not even more with us being older now we we view things through a different lens now and so um i, I think i just think it's beautiful like i I, I love the idea of them even teasing the thing with like Magneto and Rogue. I mean, you got Gambit in his fucking feelings now. I mean, the drama is certainly still there. I absolutely, I, yeah, man. I, the, you know, I don't look. I don't know what happened to the to the writer of X Men ninety seven, but two episodes in, he's he's killing it. He's killing it right now. The rumor, the internet rumor about why he was fired was because Disney found out that he had an OnlyFans. And I find that really hard to believe only because, like, I, then again, they fired James Guns for some old tweets that he had already apologized for. So maybe that's accurate. But I find it really hard to believe that Disney wouldn't have already known about the OnlyFans before hiring him to begin with. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think we highlighted it last week on last week's show, me and Indy. There was another rumor that he um, was really difficult to work with. Um, hmm. that he, he was just really high, strong. He was, had always had like a really nasty attitude sort of thing. So they do think that maybe just like the working environment with him was just too unmanageable sort of thing. Um, so that might be one of the other reasons that, um, one of the, again, the rumors, nobody's come out and actually confirmed any of this stuff. Um, you know, Disney's been quiet. Um, um, Bo De, Bo De Mayo has been quiet also. So we don't really know the, the truth behind it all. Um, so it's really just pure speculation at this point. But man, if, if and again, he did write a second season for this. So uh, if this is the level of storytelling that we're going to get, uh, bring it on, man, because I, I was hella impressed. Um, so I'm looking yeah. very much forward to episode three. Fingers crossed that that momentum continues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you for that question, Pexy. I hope you enjoyed um, the first two episodes also. And um, if you're still in the chat, um, leave your thoughts on um, on X-Men 97's first two episodes. I definitely want to know what you guys thought also. Um, Blossom, I just watched a video involving the Sentai Zords that we never got to see in this show. I also saw the Tokuja trains with past Rangers' faces on them. You think it's possible for my Rangers to morph into those said teams it won't be like super mega fail though if not how can i use them yeah please just try and avoid um super mega fail um that's interesting tokuja trains with past ranger faces on them 
I I I think that's kind of weird. Um, I mean, I don't know if I I don't I I never see I've never personally never seen those Tokuja trains. I personally would say try to avoid it, but um, you know, if that's the route you want to go, feel free to blossom. Um, <laughs> Ram Jam's comment. Yep. Yo, that's his that's his review. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um. Like oh, it, it's said, a very human thing for Rogue to do, but uh, yeah. <laughs> said R- Rogue is doing Gambit dirty, yeah, man. Mm, um, agreed. <laughs> uh, and let's see. He says, "Wasn't then wasn't X Men ninety seven childhood gold or what? The show itself made it feel like I'm in preschool again. <laughs> Plus, I have to hand it to the new guys from Magneto and Cyclops. They sound like they're actors from the old days." Yeah, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I don't know. Is the same actress back for rogue or not rogue scene. yeah she rogue is. storm um logan i think gambit uh i could be wrong about gambit but but scott i thought it was the same voice actor because the guy that the they got voice. nailed it <laughs> yeah i totally thought it was the same uh same guy that did scott also so the fact that they got new people for magneto and cyclops absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant and i love the i'm loving the long hair magneto man I'm lo- it's definitely a mm-hmm. '90s vibe for sure. Um, but yes, it made their VA voice actors from childhood rest in peace. Um, yeah, um, I think they're doing them great justice for sure. I will say, I do feel like Rogues sp- sounds a little different to me, um, and maybe at times even Wolverine. But uh, everybody else, I, I'm a I'm a really big fan of honestly. Yeah, you know, it's just age, you know, you, you'll eventually hear it. It's like with James Earl Jones. Like, I love him. He is my Vader, and obviously, but I'm kind of okay with them moving on with different voice actors for Vader now because, you know, when you hear him in World One and then Star Wars Rebels, you can kind of hear the age in his voice, unfortunately. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, Blossom agrees with Ram Jam. Rogue is doing Gambit dirty. Uh, mm-hmm. Gambit was crazy about Rogue for ages. Ram Jam says, uh, "Love triangles. First Wolverine and Jean, and now Rogue and Magneto." I still, th- I still think <laughs> yeah. there's, a, I still think that there's a little, um, little um, Wolverine and Jean love there. Like him getting an opportunity to see, like a great shot of him at the, you know, first off, the fact that he has to take Jean to the <laughs> hospital, I think, is is brilliant. <laughs> um, and then the fact of just seeing Wolverine standing outside of the hospital room as gene and scott are embracing nathan sort of thing like hit me in the gut punch like if it hit me i can only imagine what wolverine is thinking right now you know like seeing them as a family and stuff and him not being involved like that's crazy to me um Mm. but yeah always uh, always great stuff there um jessica friedman uh would you like to see a live action captain planet and the planet tears one day and do you think we see min kwan in a future power rangers project do you think we get um, Min Kwan back, Stuart? I hope so. I really want Netflix to do another one of those specials, uh, even if it's for, not for uh, Mighty Morphin per se, but if they do one for In Space, you know, in the next few years, uh, they could totally bring her back because, you know, it's all in the same universe. So why not? Uh, I hope they do. Uh, it's something that I personally would um, would really like to see. You know, I still see her... Um, I still see her on her IG page from time to time. And um, she still does some great like uh, martial arts videos and stuff. There was a a, um, a quick video that Charlie Kirsch did um, recently on IG of her like sweeping. And then she wind up like some music was playing in the background. And then she wind up taking uh, the broomstick and using it like as a bow staff and was doing some some work with it. It was pre- it's pretty badass to see. Um, so yeah, I, I absolutely would love to, to see her again, whether or not they do it that I don't know. Um, now to answer your question about the other one, um, what was the other question? Uh, would you like to see a live action captain planet and the planeteers movie one day? Look, I, I already got my live action captain planet and his name is Don Cheadle. Okay. Um, so I already, I've, I've already had it done. I don't, I don't need to see it ever again after this one, but, uh, I mean, who knows, man? I don't know. Uh, would you would you want to see a live action Captain Planet? Definitely. Uh, I I don't even need it to be good. I just 
<laughs> bring, bring me live action Captain Planet, guys. I, you know, you can take it. You can take it seriously. You can make it a goofy comedy. I don't care. I want to see a live action Captain Planet. <laughs> it's, it's, it can be the soul, too, the soulless cash grab. I still want to see it. It's too woke right now, Stuart. You can't pull that <laughs> off. It's too woke, man. <laughs> Yeah. That's what's heart, funny. You heart, wind, fire. I mean, uh, guy, climate change. Like nobody's gonna buy that in 2024. I would. Okay, okay. <laughs> I would be amazed if if someone could actually find a way to. You have to do it exactly like the original, though. So you have to make sure the ethnicities of the characters are exactly the same. I would love to see if someone could possibly make a captain planet reboot and make it as unwoke as possible because i don't think that'd be possible at all <laughs> but i would love someone to actually want to do that as like a challenge just to see like <laughs> I, mean, I think it'd be a fun disaster is all i'm saying <laughs> i mean look they're making a toxic avenger movie um, but then again, that's two completely different realms, right? Like that's two completely mm -hmm. different realms. But I, I just remember like the Toxic Avenger cartoon and then the Captain Planet cartoon <laughs> back in the day. Um, See, I never watched the Toxic Avenger cartoon. I watched the movie and I was shocked when I learned that they actually ooh, yeah. turned this into a cartoon for kids. <laughs> yeah, for kids. Yeah, it was two, yeah, it was like, two completely different things for sure from the live action to animated. Like they did that a lot in the eighties, like Rambo, RoboCop. It's like those were not meant for kids, but they made <laughs> cartoons out of it. <laughs> found a way. They found a way. Um, you know, maybe like um, maybe like a television series. I don't know if I would do a movie though, but maybe a Captain Planet television series, like a Netflix original or something. I don't know. I don't know if I. I, I really don't know. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting question. I don't know. Um, Johnny Marrero, what's up, Johnny? Do you think there will be a Power Ranger comic based on the untold season Hexagon with Tommy and Jason as mentors to the new team of Rangers? Um, you know, I will say never say never. And I say that because, you know, I think Boom Studios, um, you know, look, they've managed to somehow include like Super Sentai rangers or costumes in a series that had never well i can't say had never i'm trying to think now that they since they had used them on mega fail if um if that kind of opened the door for them but i think it was flashman and i can't remember if they utilized flashman or not in um in in mega fail but boom studios have have tapped into like past super sentai suits before and brought them to comic books so you know, I think if there's a an unused script out there or an untold season, you know, I I will just say never say never. I'm not going to give a confident yes or a confident no, but I would I I think there's an opportunity, but that's just me. All I'll say is that if they do that, I would definitely read that, uh, especially if they uh, got Amit Bamik, uh, the writer for or the, the writer that pitched that season. If they got him to write for the comic book, definitely. Um, his next question is, are you excited that Wizards Revival has been greenlit to full series, meaning the full season? Could this open the door for more Disney Channel shows to be revived? Um, other than wizards and that's so raven um possibly i guess I, I guess for me it would be the idea of like how um how popular was the show during its time um if it um you know if it was pretty popular like those two shows then then yeah absolutely um, I mean, they gotta if they're gonna bring back uh wizards they and uh since they already brought back that's so raven they should also bring back the greatest anime of all time, Corey in the House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't Let's know do if it. anyone remembers. I just dated myself with that meme. I don't Let's even know do if it. anyone remembers that meme was the thing. <laughs> Corey in the House. I love it. I love it. Yeah, let's do it for sure. Um, after the Darkest Hour comic era ends in June, what do you think will happen do you think this could start a transition of season three of MMPR? Do you think they'll go straight to Zeo? Because I got to be honest, if Zeo comic happens, I would love to see Kimberly stick around and be a Zeo Ranger of five red. Uh, what do you think? Um, you know, that I don't that I don't know. I, I haven't read the comics in such a long time, Johnny. 
Uh, I was always under the impression that they were kind of going in order from MMPR. The next one would be like Zeo that they certainly tackled. But I don't even know. I'm sure they probably jumped the shark a long time ago as far as canon timeline wise. So I don't even know if season three of MMPR would even be up next. Like, have they even done like an alien Rangers sort of storyline yet? Like that, I don't, that I don't even know. Um, but I would be open for them to go into a zeal mode, but I think MMPR probably just sells so incredibly well for them though. But again, it's, it's, it's hard for me to tell because I have not read the comics in about over a year. Same here. I, I think around the time I stopped reading the comic, uh, there was an issue where Zed got his staff broken. And I remember being excited because I was like, oh, that explains the tape that we see in the show. Because I guess the prop must have broken the show. So when you see, see uh, Zed with his staff, there's like noticeable duct tape on it. <laughs> so I, I thought <laughs> yeah. that was a hilarious reference. Yeah, absolutely. That was a good one. Um, and then last but not least, Johnny says, also, how do you feel about the recent Power Ranger reboot news lately? And I'm kind of glad that you brought this up, um, Johnny, because I have been I have been meaning to do a video um, on this uh, and I ha have not yet. Um, have you seen the reboot news, Stuart? No, I didn't know there was any new news. So uh, let's let's pull this up. Maybe I'll actually just cut this out and make it our own um news but um since johnny wants to ask about the power ranger news uh the reboot news that came out um i want to say maybe about a week or two ago um jin saku over on x shout out to my boy jin for coming through once again with some new information here we've been dying for some um um we've been dying for some power ranger news and uh homeboy really delivered here um so let's go ahead and bring this up um this is um and he had he had two two posts. Um, well, this will be the first one. He says, uh, "I told y'all I gotcha." So, and we even get a color scheme here. So, this is what Jin Saku, his sources are certainly telling him. Again, you know, this can certainly all change. But according to Jin, this script and stuff has been done kind of for a while now. But this is what he's this is kind of what he's been hearing. I told you I got y'all. Tommy Green, Luciana red derek blue aubrey uh yellow and vanessa pink um and before we move on i just want to say jonathan entwistle has been teasing um tommy for a while uh, very early on i remember he posted on instagram a picture of like a cloud background and it had actually a white ranger photo like in the very middle of it um, or like the, the the White Ranger helmet. Um, and then in a recent post, he also mentioned the idea of that they were going they were going to honor JDF in their upcoming reboot. He was bummed, you know, that he wasn't going to be around to to see it, but that they were going to honor him in their own way. So the fact that they're making Tommy here, the Green Ranger, I think is is rather fitting. He says um, the Power Rangers is the working title. Jonathan Entwistle is set to direct and write the script while Jenny Klein is still producing. So again, Jonathan Entwistle right now is writing and directing the current Karate Kid reboot movie that's set to go ahead and drop this December. Each episode will be an hour long, which we did do a video here on Hero Report to inform you of. Jenny Klein's um, website um, did update that to show hour-long episodes. The current draft is set to be an Elseworlds story set in angel grove so we are heading back to angel grove in here um he also goes on to jinsaku in another post that we'll talk about here in a second kind of refers to this sort of like as a, a what if kind of story but he says the current draft is set to be an else world story set in angel grove tommy starts as the leader but betrays the team halfway through the show mm. new suits not mighty morphin though and Hasbro wants to begin filming in 2025. Hopefully, hopefully it finally gets picked up off the ground. Um, so those are some of the new bits of information here. Uh, any questions you might have or anything that jumps out to you, Stuart? I kind of... I can't remember what the color scheme was, but uh, he mentioned not Mighty Morphin, but he also mentions with oh, uh, Tommy being there. Yeah, what it's if, right here. Uh, Tom, Tommy's green. Yeah. Luciano is red. So we've got yellow, red. We've got blue, 
we've got yellow and we've got pink so um but yeah so with tommy being green this may disprove this theory i have but what if the suits are like based on the die ranger suits uh the one that tommy had when he was the uh, white ranger the white ranger oh it could be like a, a revamped version of those yeah. The more modern take on them. That's possible. I mean, he did he Jonathan Nentwistle did tease the White Ranger um helmet um a while ago. It's probably been like two years or so ago. It's been a minute. Um so you, you might be onto something there in that regards. Um so yeah, it looks like we still have a team of three men, two boys. I mean three three men, two girls, um, Luciana being a red female and Vanessa being the uh, pink. Um, pink ranger tommy green Derek blue and a male yellow ranger this time around um he also does clarify he says it's it's um did this pull up correctly yeah it says uh it's a cool what if concept where what if um tommy was never a new student in angel grove and had been there from the start and got recruited by zordon with new kids so Jason, Billy, Zach, Trini, and Kimberly could all still exist in the school as regular students that never mm. got recruited. Okay. So that's how that's how he breaks that down for me. And so I did ask a couple questions. I said, uh, Aubrey, is that a male or a female? He says that's a male. I says, you mentioned what if like Zordon had picked a different group of teenagers. Is Zordon in it? Um, and I said, I guess that would also go with my question of, who the villain is Rita again, or taking another route. He says for is, is Zordon in it? He just says, yes. Or is Rita again, or taking another route? So he answered just, yes. I don't know if that was too, is Zordon in it? Or is Rita going to be the villain again? He just says, yes. So maybe that's yes to both of them. Uh, and I says, do you know if Hasbro is keeping an eye on how Karate Kid does, like if they've seen the script and confidence still in Entwistle? He says, yes, I heard right before the strike happened that they love the script. I'm assuming once things are ready to take off, they're going to uh, let Entwistle finish his story. They also wanted Power Rangers to go on hiatus before going full on reset for the brand. So it's working. Uh, so it's working in their favor. So it seems as though they're kind of open to the idea like it's been a while since we've had Power Rangers on television, you know, to kind of separate yourself. I guess very similar to how, you know, the DCU, if you will, is kind of wanting to take a fresher start and kind of separate itself a little bit from the past stuff to kind of give it a, a fresh feel, if you will. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I'm uh, I'm kind of on board with, um, with, with this concept. Um, it feels like it's definitely going to be Tommy Oliver. Um, you know, I, I, I there's a part of me like I I will say this. I do wish that that we would get out of Angel Grove. I there's a part of me that wants a little bit more originality in that regards. The idea of bringing Tommy Oliver back, I have no problem with. I'm actually really a big fan of the idea of them getting a like new characters involved. Um I mean, when they say this is a reboot, I guess it really is a reboot in that sense of like, uh, and not necessarily, well, maybe, I don't want to say necessarily a remake, but it does feel like a reboot in that sense of like, we're still in Angel Grove. There's still characters that you remember. You know, for me personally, I probably would have stayed away from all of that um, in the sense of I probably would have wanted to create something new. Because my worry would then be there's so much that connects to the old stuff. Like if Zordon is there, if Rita's the villain again, if we do have a Tommy Oliver, is this going to make people immediately compare it to what we have had before? Whereas if you gave us really a fresh take of just brand new characters, a brand new setting, them being recruited and coming across their powers in completely different ways. I think that's a much fresher take on it and a less chance of it immediately being compared. I mean, people are always going to compare to it, but I think the greater chance of it now being compared is, is like twofold. If you ask me. So there are some elements to behind it that I dig. Like I dig the what if concept. I just hope that, um, 
the story beats are significantly different. Like if it's just Zordon, if it's just Tommy, if it's just Rita, that's that oh, I can live with that. But I need every other story beat to be significantly different, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then there's me. I think I mentioned this before. If like if it were me that I was like personally involved in it, um, I would kind of go the route of the JJ Abrams Star Trek movie and then just and have it be like a specific time travel story that would involve one character from, you know, the previous well-established Power Rangers universe. But basically because it's the time travel, it splits basically this into its own universe. So I can kind of keep elements from whatever Power Ranger seasons I want, but like still be able to tell a completely uh, unique original story. I mean, that's like what this is. Yeah, but I say that's what kind of what yeah. it feels like, right? Yeah. If it, if it very much is sort of like an Elseworlds concept. I mean, that does feel like what J.J. Abrams is. I mean, J.J., in that regards, I mean, he still uses the same characters like Kirk and, and whatnot, you know, like the whole original crew. But the perspective is slightly different. And in this regards, like, I think they brought Spock in, right, from the J.J. Abrams one out of that timeline. I mean, it feels like a, a, that's, that's the Tommy Oliver in that sense. Like, uh, granted, he's not being pulled from you know our timeline and being planted in another one but the idea of utilizing that character at least as like the commonality between the two um yeah, as long i just my only worry Stuart, is that damn kid from cobra kai is gonna get this role you think he's gonna, gonna play tommy god i mean people have <laughs> wanted this kid to play tommy for so long and i just do not care for him as an actor like just anybody but that dude please um but he you know he might he might pull it off but uh you know so i'm fascinated i'm fascinated um it's a, some directions i probably personally wouldn't have gone myself but uh i think the idea of injecting brand new characters it not directly being mighty morphin power rangers and like i like you said if it can have different story beats then yeah then i i would be i i'll, I'll probably be all in on it but we'll see mm -hmm. Um, Man, that's funny. I, I don't mind the actor. I just, you know, hated the character that one season. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just him as the character. I don't know. Maybe I got to see him in, in more things to fully appreciate what he's doing. I don't know. Um, Doomsday. What's an unpopular opinion you have about one of the Power Rangers? Uh, for me, it's that Dax is a really cool Blue Ranger. I realized a few weeks ago that I can actually relate to him since he's a movie guy and I'm a movie guy. Uh, I don't know if it's something unpopular. Is, uh... Oh, what you oh, got? Sorry, I, I, I was gonna say. I just think of uh, Link Carter's uh, video where, like, every time Dax like uh, talks, he just interrupts. He goes, "Shut up, Dax." <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if I've got um, I don't know. Do you have an unpopular opinion about anybody? Mm, man, um, I mean, I guess my I don't even know if it's unpopular. I mean, mines would just be like randomly like I think RJ is the best mentor we have in Power Rangers. That'd be mine, but I don't think that's an unpopular opinion. Like, that's just I think he's underappreciated, but I think he's probably the one of the best mentors we've had. I think okay, I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion or not, but since you brought up RJ, I think Jungle Fury has some of the most like exciting action in uh, Power Rangers, like some of the best fight choreography. Um, but like I don't hear people bring it. I hear people like saying that Jungle Fury is an underrated season all the time, but I don't hear too many people bringing up the fight specifically. So there's that. Um, and then I also would say this. I don't know if this is an unpopular theory or opinion, but uh, I think Dino Charge is probably the funniest uh, Power Ranger season. Okay, I ain't got. Is it because of Coda? Does Coda put it over the top for you? Oh, he's one of the reasons, definitely. But I also think like uh, Xander, especially like when he's interacting with the modern world, and especially when he he assembles his own team of of like Rangers. Uh, you know, there there are moments like that where it's it's just makes me laugh hella hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, I'm trying to sort this out again for some reason. I feel like I'm missing a question in here somewhere. Oh, you know, it's because I think it was uh, the reply. That's what was throwing me off. Okay. Um, Doomsday, do you think it's kind of dumb how Marvel fans switch up so much? Uh, for example, when Age of Ultron originally came out, people were saying stuff like Marvel is getting stale, but now they've suddenly switched up and are now saying stuff like Ultron is a Marvel villain at its peak. <laughs> I mean, are they really so saying funny. that? I, I, haven't, I haven't heard anyone say that. Um, if anything, 
Like I remember uh, when Age of Ultron came out, I feel like me and a lot of people loved it, but I think we were more swept up in the hype. I think it was just one of those movies where the more we thought about it, it was actually Age of Ultron is kind of similar to Man of Steel in this way. The more I watch it, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, man, this movie's actually not that good. But like, I remember when I first watched it, I'm like, this is awesome, you know? I get you. I'm. I feel. I feel terrible that you felt that way about Man of Steel, man. Usually, for me, it was like the other way around. The more I saw, I I, I love it more and more. But uh, you, know, you know, and I hear that from everyone. Like everyone says, the more they watch it, the more they appreciate it. And I wish I felt that way. <laughs> you know, Age of Ultron, I think, has one of the most underrated fights that's not talked about, and that's Hulkbuster versus the Hulk. I I that hardly pretty cool. I hardly ever hear that one kind of brought up. Um. But no, I don't think my opinion has changed. I, you know, who was the guy Spader? Who's the guy that they had um, that James did the Spader. voice for James Spader? Uh, great Ultron, but I just didn't, you know, I just didn't care for it. Um, so people that are talking backwards now, I think it's just a case of like they want to prove to themselves that like the past MCU was better than what we're getting now, and so now everything about the past MCU has got to be better than what we're getting now. When in reality, that's not the case. Like there were, you know, highs and lows of Marvel's first three phases. Not everything was a banger uh, in those first three phases either. Um, so maybe it's just a case of people wanting to rewrite history in the sense of like because they've been dissatisfied with the MCU now. Now they gotta they gotta validate the first three phases that everything was peak Marvel then. Um, so yeah. yeah, that's the only thing I can think of. A lot of people seem to forget that during phase two, especially it's like for Guardians that you got, you also had a dark world. <laughs> Oh God, yeah, the phase two I think was a little bit rough. Um, but then again, I I, di I didn't care for Ant Man and the Wasp Quantum Mania. I think if anything, it's probably the case that they probably feel that like at least between the valleys that we had maybe more cons consecutive hits, one after the other after the other sort of thing. But I'll have to go back and look at the first um the first phases because I, I mean I think there's just as many valleys as there are in their our current iterations um as there were before. But who knows um Dottila, with wrestlemania being one week away what is your excitement level any other shows you're planning to watch that week like gcw or supercard of honor maybe supercard of honor uh i'm not too familiar with what jcw has right now to be quite frank with you Dottila, when it comes to wrestlemania i think i'm like three weeks behind on wrestling right now me and the girlfriend have not watched like any wrestling um we had our trip to austin uh, and we've just been really busy around the house um, uh, with 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 kiddo. So, you know, I've, I've been tired. She's been tired handling kid. I've I got a, a job. I got a promotion at my job that's been kind of exhausting, too. Um, so when by the time I get home, the only thing I want to do is like sleep. Uh, and then I'm kind of in a Star Wars novel phase right now where like when I do have downtime, I've been trying to do a little bit more reading. Um, so I think that's kind of taken me uh, away from wrestling also. I really have only seen like clips on social media as of right now. Um, and so, you know, Dottila with the $9, damn, with the $10 um, uh, super chat. Thank you so much. Are you ready? I said, are you ready for the WrestleMania madness? You know, I want to be more hyped than I am right now, Dottila. And it's not because it's not because of the fact that. I, I don't feel like the buildup has been good. I just haven't watched the buildup. <laughs> I haven't watched the buildup properly. So I'm literally like three, probably like three weeks behind on wrestling for Raw and SmackDown. So once I once I get into it, I, I'm sure I'll, I'll be even more hyped. Um, if anything, if there was a concern, and again, I have not watched it. So I don't know which direction that they've taken. But for me... I almost feel like the buildup has been solely on The Rock versus Cody Rhodes, and we're not even getting a one-on-one -on -one match. It's actually a tag team match. I feel like the night one has been built up more than his focus on Roman Reigns, which I think it certainly needs to be. Maybe that's something that they've kind of course corrected in the past week or two. Again, I'm still very much in the beginning stages of this proper buildup, I have a lot to certainly catch up on, but as long as they can make sure that Cody, you know, changes his, I don't want to change, changes his focus, but we get some Roman and Cody sort of one-on-one -on -one stuff. Um, then yeah, I'll be, I'll probably be even more hyped for it. But, um, 
So yeah, I know you want me to be even hype, even more hype for Dasa, but I'm just not there yet. I'm just not there yet. But I will be. What about you, Sword? Are you catching? Are you watching wrestling at all right now? Uh, currently not at the moment, unfortunately. Okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, and then last but not least, uh, we got Marcelino in here. I just wanted to save him for last because I, I thought I could get Dante this question out of the way a little bit quicker. Um, if Cara Dune were to return, uh, which actress did they use to recast the character? Some people say Lucy Lawless. Do you agree or should it be a different actress? I mean, who knows? If um, uh, Who's the actress that played Cara Dune? What was her name? Uh, Gina Carano. If Gina Carano gets her way, you know, Disney will be hiring her uh, rather soon. Um, she's doing I think she's like suing Disney or something like that. She wants to get her yeah. job back. Um, but um, so I don't know. But no, if she were, I, I don't have an actress in mind. But for me, Lu Lucy Lawless, I think is oh, damn. That's rude to say. I'm not going to say it, but um, I, I'm I, I don't think I I don't think it should be Lucy Lawless. I, th I think it should be somebody else, though. You know what's what's funny is like my number one choice is already in the Mandalorian, so it wouldn't work. But it would be um, uh, the one who is <clears throat> like recovering a Imperial officer who turns out is actually still with the Empire. Um, I forgot that actress's name, but she was in a movie that just came out uh, called Love Lies Bleeding, and she is freaking ripped in that movie like yeah. She, yeah i think she could have uh she could have played the role well but unfortunately she's already in mandalorian so i don't think it'll happen <laughs> yeah i don't have anybody in mind off the top of my head i think i think we're probably done with the Cara dune character but if anything comes to mind um after this marceline i'll hit you up and i'll let you know um why is lucasfilm hesitant on bringing back barris Afi? Um, they had plenty of opportunities to bring her back in Rebels or Ahsoka, yet they never pulled the trigger. I mean, no disrespect to the late Ray Stevenson, but if you replace Balin with Barris, the same story would still play out. Dave Filoni even said that the original plan was to kill her off at the end of Ahsoka trial arc, um, but scrapped it because she had future plan. He had future plans for her. You know, I just think we're past Barris Afi at this point, and I think maybe even Dave Filoni recognizes that maybe at one point in time he had future plans for her but uh you know i look i don't even know how popular barris Offy is as a star wars character i mean maybe ahsoka fans you know i'm sure ahsoka fans are probably still holding on to that storyline thread and watch season two just proved me wrong and barris Offy certainly comes back but i there's a part of me that just wonders since that moment especially if his original plan was to kill her off and he didn't and had plans. I wonder if she's killed off in Dave Filoni's mind in the sense of like, I'm just moving on to other things right now. Like her story is just far progressed that moment. Uh, there's no point in coming back or maybe it's something that Dave Filoni tackles in like a tale of the Jedi series. You know, I think, um, you know, he did have a focus on Ahsoka in one or two episodes, I mean, who's to say that um, another Tale of the Jedi isn't another Ahsoka story that he tells before we get to see her again in Ahsoka? And uh, maybe she does bump into Barris off screen. We just haven't had the opportunity to see it yet. So I don't know. I, I think it's maybe we're past that time. But if it's, if it's Dave Filoni, uh, I think maybe Tales of the Jedi you'll see it over. If I had to assume, I would say Tales of the Jedi cartoon series rather than an Ahsoka live action. What about you, Stuart? I totally, uh, I totally didn't have to look up who that was because I might have forgotten. But yeah, now that I <laughs> have my little refresher, um, yeah, I don't know, like, because there's no current project out ex except for the Bad Batch. I think right now the Bad Batch is the only like Star Wars project that I could see her popping up in. But like, Ahsoka season two just feels like the it feels like the story they're going with there. I don't see how they could possibly fit her into that. But like Bad Batch, um, she would still be around possibly in that time period, um, especially because she's also probably still be pretty young and we haven't seen her in anything that takes place after the Bad Batch. So I think maybe that would be the one place to bring her back if they wanted to. But other than that, I have no idea. <laughs> um, and then he says Pierce Brosnan 
uh, Denise Richards and Daniel Craig have all said that there should never be a female James Bond, with Daniel Craig specifically saying there should simply be better parts for women and actors of color. Why should a woman play James Bond when there should be a part just as good as James Bond before a woman? What do you think? Why should a woman why should a woman play James Bond when there should be a part or maybe he meant to say, why shouldn't a woman play James Bond when there should be a part just as good as James Bond, but for a woman? I don't know. Um, I will say, and maybe this is unpopular. Um, you know, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think a woman should play James Bond. Um, that might be like the most misogynist thing you'll hear me say. No, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't, I just don't. I'm just canceled now. I <laughs> no, I just, I, I, I mean, I agree with them. I don't. I mean, James Bond is a man. That's what he is in the novels. James Bond is a man. Um, if you want to get a 007, okay. I'm cool with that being a woman. But you're not about to change James Bond into Jamila Bonds. Like, no. Like, it's it's James Bond. It's it's a male role. Um, if they want to make another 007 movie, that's fine. Make a 007, whatever the title is, and then have a woman in that lead role of playing 007, the same category and the same number agent that James Bond once was. I think that's the legacy that should be, um, that should be certainly carried on. But the idea of James Bond being made into a woman, no, I'm not, I'm not down for that at all. Um, but I, I do think when he says there are better parts for women and actors of color to play, maybe he's assuming that they're passing that torch on for the 007 role, which I think is what they might be planning on doing. Um, if that's not a route that they certainly go, I do think James Bond will continue to be a man. But um, what about you, Stuart? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, I just, you know, you also kind of take away like uh, one aspect of his character, which of course is an aspect that they definitely, I mean, I don't know, fixed is the right word to use because I know I'm going to piss off James Bond fans no matter what I say here. Uh, but, you know, obviously when you look at the things that do not work about old James Bond, you know, one of the biggest things is how he is a huge womanizer, even if he does it because, you know, it's it's his way of sneaking information and that kind of stuff. Um, since going to a woman, the uh, whole sex sexist out, uh, I mean, like, you know, to be artist, fair, to which, be fair, yes, they I, did get rid of with Daniel Craig, I will say. <laughs> I mean, you know, she she could just be a man eater too. You know, I mean, <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, James Bond is is a female eater for sure, um, in his own way. So I do think like the the attributes could certainly still very much be there, but I don't know. For me, the idea of like James Bond is James Bond. Um, if and I think if you want to continue around that path of a James Bond movie, I say you go the route of a female 007. But mm -hmm. it's just odd to me to make James Bond a female at that point. Yeah, I I, I would agree. Uh, no reason you can't have an agent that exists in that world that's also mm -hmm. like a double O agent who is a woman and just have her be the main character. Yeah. I, for me, I think that's like the closest that you'll get. If you can, if 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 she's if she's that if she's just that good, like um, James James uh, Bond certainly was to where she would then acquire that 007 sort of um, category, then yeah, then I think you continue the, well, I don't know if they're going to continue the franchise in that regards, but if there's an opportunity there, then yeah, I say you, I say you pass the number on to a woman, but not, not the name of James Bond. No, I think you just make a new set of new set of movies in that regards, just being 007. Now, if they do that, which is, you know, take the title of 007 and give it to someone else, like not necessarily just a woman per se, but someone who is clearly not James Bond, would you, if you were the producer, continue that from the same world as uh, Daniel Craig's James Bond, or would you just completely reboot the universe? No, I would, I would say, I would continue it from James, from oh, Daniel okay. Craig's world. Yeah, I would continue it because I, I didn't see the last movie, but doesn't he die in the last movie? Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler everyone. It's been out for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's been out a while. So and so in, in that regards, I, I do think like if um because I think it's a status, right? Isn't a 007 a status? It's not it's mm -hmm. not like an agent number, right? Not specifically an agent number. It's uh actually no, I think it's uh double O is the status, but the number okay, is the specific number is... to the people. Yeah. I get you, um, I get you. Yeah. 
But so a lot I, of people I, keep trying to say that it's the same thing with the name James Bond. Like, oh, that's why the actor always changes. It's like, no, that is not true. Uh, you, 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 if yeah, you no, watch the true. James Bond movies, they confirm that's not true. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, if she's good enough to get a double O status and, you know, I don't know if they retire the numbers, you know, um, but yeah, why not give him a 007 status if uh, give her that agent number if it's available? I don't know how that works though, but uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, good questions, Marcelino. Thank you so much for that. That's probably as close as uh, misogynistic as you'll hear me <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, Adam doesn't want 007 to be played by a woman. You are canceled. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, guys, that's just uh, just some of my thoughts. I'm kind of curious to know what you guys think um i'm look they clearly are going to be making another james bond movie regardless though um i think they're sitting on it though uh i'm kind of curious when we're going to get another announcement um but i have heard that the family um is 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 in talks or at least is is thinking about uh another entry so we'll see who they wind up getting but uh, i am kind of curious to see where the franchise goes from here for sure but um yeah. all right guys other than that as hollywood studios is still around there will always be james bond movies <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, guys, let us know some of your thoughts. Uh, we appreciate you guys continuing to stick around with us um, through this whole entire episode. We really appreciate it. We got like 30 something people viewing us over on Twitter. Uh, guys, like this uh, tweet, retweet it if it's possible. We definitely would appreciate it. Um, if you're not following us or subscribe to us yet over on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, please go ahead and do so. On YouTube, we're on our way to 1,400 subscribers. I think we're at like 1,390 right now. So we're definitely trying to climb the the ranks here if we can get to like 3k subscribers by the end of the year i would absolutely love that guys uh so continue to tell everybody about a plus hero report like share these videos edit this stuff out if you want post these videos wherever uh any help will certainly be appreciated um Stuart, if people want to find you on social media do you still have social media where are you man uh, you guys can still find me on Instagram at TurboStew01, uh, but no, I'm no longer uh, doing Twitter, and I don't really plan on going back anytime uh, soon. Save your save, save your mental state, man. You're making a good choice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it brings up – okay, like Twitter brought out the worst in me. Like I would look back on some of my tweets and I'd be like, why did I say that, you know, a lot of times. Uh, so I just – yeah, I feel, I feel like – Twitter was very unhealthy for me. That's not to say Twitter is bad for everyone. I'm sure there's some people that, you know, it's good for, but personally. <laughs> um, and I also want to say, uh, love the hairdo, uh, bold Thank step you. and cutting it all off. Um, I do have a question. Do you feel weaker without all that hair now? Or do you feel like a new man? I feel like a new man. And if anything, my, my head feels so much lighter, like lifting it up, you know, even though my hair wasn't even that heavy or anything, it just feels so much more weightless, weightless, you know, <laughs> you know, I am, I am thinking about my next haircut. Uh, and I'm thinking about making the bold move. I don't know if I want to go as short as you, but, uh, I am thinking about taking this down a notch. Um, I think I'm ready for it to kind of grow out again from the bottom up and start a new um so we'll see my next haircut i'm gonna try and see if i can get one next weekend perhaps but uh yeah all this uh all this fuzz man might be uh be coming off for sure it's been a minute since i seen my scalp or like had a buzz cut but uh you know maybe i'll i might go that route man i'm kind of tired of it the uh, uh you know what's funny the last time i uh, got a haircut before this most recent one was four years ago and i remember wow. that because literally it was the day before quarantine went into effect i got a buzz cut and for four years i hadn't cut it since wow bro wow uh well we'll see how long it takes you to to cut it again but uh it mm -hmm. looks good man. it looks good um Guys, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so right here at A Plus Opinions. Very active everywhere. Facebook, uh, which is our main hub. If you want to keep up with the news throughout the week, check us out over there. Also over on Twitter. Catch us also on IG. We have a TikTok page as well, um, at Hero Report. Uh, we do, uh, I, I think I might start including our top five trailers of the week on there. We do a ton of movie trailers over there for you guys and the occasional clips from our Hero Report show. So check us out over on Twitter as well. Uh, we are also on Spotify or wherever you certainly listen to your audio podcasts, um, Apple Podcasts, wherever the case may be. 
Uh, we also have a Discord forum. So if you like your um, forum communities, uh, feel free to join us on our A-plus uh, opinions forum. There is a link in the description box below. But other than that, guys, that's going to do it for us here. We've got another Boon Boomger review for you guys later this week. The ones who live review. X-Men 97 review and uh, hopefully any movie trailers or movie reviews that we see throughout the week and any uh, news uh, that we feel is worth reporting on. We'll definitely keep you up to date on our YouTube page. So subscribe to us over on YouTube and wherever you watch us at. But until next time, guys, that'll do it for us here. Uh, we'll certainly see you guys next week. So do us a big favor. As always, take care of yourselves, take care of each other and keep it a plus. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye.